Bum 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 bum. Hello, everybody. All right then. How are we doing? How are we doing? That's a little bit high, is then. That's a little bit high. Uh. Should be better. Yeah, that's better. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? How goes everything? We have Patron 70. Germany does not invade Belgium in 1914, so UK does not declare war. How does this affect the Royal Navy? Well, um, I hope you're going to enjoy the way I took this. As always, when someone gives me a question, I have full license to go where I want to wander with it. And I have wandered. Of course I've wandered. So, hello, Knights of Apron. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Mark Harkness. Certainly looking at something like that, Mark Harkness. Hello, History Vanguard. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Donald Gunnhammer. And by the way, Mark Harkness has put in, at least uh, I look at it anyway, what happens if the uh, the R maybe if the Britain stays out of war together is certainly a different matter than what happens if the Britain has to wait for a different excuse. The question is, is whether you have time for another excuse to come up. That is the thing. It, it depends on how they go about doing it and how quickly the war is over. Because if it turned into somehow into another run of the Franco-Prussian War, then the British might not have time to get involved. They might not have time for that excuse. Hello, Peter Dawson. How are you going, huh? Hello, Adrian's Verdun. Blessings of the 15-inch 42 gun. Uh, Yarrow boiler and Parsons geared reduction steam turbine be upon you. Very nice collection. A very nice collection. <sighs> Hello, Amelia Burrow. Hello, Calvin Gasper. Hello, DG40. Hello, Tanifoka. Hello, Malaga. Hello, Mark Harkness. Hello, Byron. Hello, Colin Cameron. Hello, Colin. It's good you're here because this was proposed by you, of course. Hello, Severin Sertu. Hello, Mikey Newman. And hello. Ooh. Um, Night 6 one Do not count on that one. Do not count because. By my getting and my remembering of the Cressy class, they were all part of a very certain cruiser squadron. And um, if I remember correctly, well, yeah, the the, the seventh cruiser squadron does not have a good experience in this scenario. Okay. There is no good scenario for any of the ships which would have been attached to the Channel's fleet in this. There just isn't. Okay? Maybe if there's no war, there's a chance, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll talk about that as we go on. What planes flew from, H flew from HMS Vindictive? Oh, well, that's an interesting one. Um, if I remember correctly, the question is what flew, planes flew from HRS Vindictive when? Is the, uh, sort of the one I, ha I have to sort of answer. When she's first fitted with aircraft, now, what did she get fitted? It wasn't the pups, was it? It was, no, it was the pups. She starts off with with pups, but then when she goes to the Baltic, she has um, sop with camels, um, the two F one ship camel fighters, one and a half strutters, which are an interesting interesting aircraft, and, and short type one eighty fours. They're an interesting group of aircraft. Honestly, I have to admit. 
Um, the Griffin she also carried were probably the most reliable aircraft of the border. The Sopwith Camels are kind of like, um, how do I put this politely, a later conversion of a um, land-based aircraft to a sea-based aircraft, in that it didn't really have the excuse of not being designed for rough landings. Okay, If you're designed for rough landings at the level of which a Sopwith Camel can theoretically take, you'd ex expect you to be a bit more survivable when it came to seaborne landings, but you know, life happens. Hello, man of uh, Panzer. I say British involvement in Model One was inevitable. It depends. Is it involved? Is it? Uh, its involvement in World War One is inevitable, but World War One happening in 1914 is not inevitable because it depends on what the British government does. It really does, and I'll get into this. Well, if you consider, after the Franco-Prussian War, did Germany take over large amounts of French coast? No. The odds are they wouldn't in this scenario. They'd just, they'd probably take off land to the east, not to the west. For reasons of actually controlling it. They might want to take sections of northern France, but it's more likely to take the industrialised part than the port part. After all, they have their own large ports. They don't need more ports. How many Queen Elizabeths Mark IIs did the RN just order? Interesting question. You're going to, you're going to enjoy the question at the end of the, long, of the Long Patrol this video. Ah, well, you enjoyed Hawkins class. They are good ships. And I am doing shameless book plugs. Still, I, I, I am shameless about this, so I even put it in the slide. It is a shameless book plug. My book. As you all know, I am starting off on some more books at the moment. I am prepping for all sorts of things. And I have to admit, I'm slowly transitioning away. Well, let's put it this way. I'm transitioned already as far away as I can be, and I'm transitioning more away from being dependent upon universities for my income. Because I love them, I love the students, I love the teaching, and I want to I always enjoy and want to do it. But I I find the internal politics a little bit problematic sometimes, as that's not really my style of things. And um I have to say, I'm a sucker for a regular paycheck. And the thing about YouTube and Patreon is you can't quite accurately predict what you're going to get. You, you, you estimate, but you always, if you're sensible, you underestimate. And then you base on that. You don't base on what you might get full amount. But it comes at the same time each month, and it's kind of reliable like that. And I like that. That's... That, that's um, and, you see, the thing is, the university paychecks don't always have the first part either. In that, 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 that sometimes the hours you put in for on a contract and what you get paid are wildly different. Eventually you get paid, but you really prefer to be paid when you're supposed to be. P. Dawson, does the Entente Cordiale mean we guarantee the French protection by treaty? Nope. Nope. In fact, I'll get into the Entente Cordiale, but um, it really doesn't. In fact, the Entente Cordiale is taken is a series of agreements signed in April 1904. And, well, I'll be getting into them, but basically the documents that are actually signed... Do not say it's an alliance. In fact, the British go out of their way to make sure everyone understands it is not an alliance. It is an agreement of friendship, not an alliance. There is a difference. So why does the question make sense? Why do we want to talk about this? Well, because actually there are a lot of factors in play. The British government are... No more uniform in their view of going to war with the Germans than any government ever is on war. 
and there are powerful voices trying to avoid war and powerful things working to avoid war. There's also the fact that the Germans actually do, as part of the planning process, decide they're not going to invade the Netherlands because they want it as a port to try and get around any British blockade. They want it as a neutral port, a neutral safe entry, so they can try and use it to get around any blockade. There are therefore factors being considered about why, whether or not you need to necessarily do an invasion. So obviously the Germans are open to the idea of ignoring the small countries and working a way around them. So this makes sense. But this also makes sense in that this will have a significant impact on the development of technology of the next 20 to 30 years. Technology doesn't develop in a vacuum. The example I'll use in the Long Patrol, and I'll go into more of results of this, about this at in there, is that with current space technology, we are really starting to push up space tech. But that's because people are interested, people are investing, and because people are looking at outside of Earth for more resources. But the point is, and the point we should be considering, is that we've also, at the same time, there's lots of technology we've lost. In this period, the pace of armor technology and gunnery technology development was absolutely astonishing. And that's an important thing to remember. The pace of development of armor and gunnery in technology is astonishing. It is really being piled on. One of the things you have to think about is that, okay, the 15-inch 50 is something they look at for the F3, which is a design contemporary with the Nelsons coming after the G3s. It's the idea of building a battle cruiser with nine 15-inch guns, or rather more or something closer to a fast battleship than Nelson and Ro uh, Rodney were. And it's a really interesting design. But that 15-inch 50 doesn't come from nowhere. That 15-inch 50 has been around a while. And in fact, one of the upgrades which was going into the other admirals would have been the 15-inch 50. I'm fairly... I'm not 100% sure on that when I say that. Please note, I'm not saying this 100% guaranteed. But from a lot of what I've read is that was one of the factors which was involved in it. And one of the factors that's involved in the turret design of Hood herself, is the ability to take the upgraded gun. So that's hanging around there. The trouble is, Treaty says upgrading guns is problematic. Happy New Year to the bathtub historian. Hot tub historian. Not bathtub. Maybe Whirlpool bathtub, though. Ooh, that could be a next series, Whirlpool bathtub. I just need to find a Whirlpool bathtub. I think I'll stick with the hot tub. Mm-hmm. Um... Mr. I have... I only use... I have now 32 subscribers, and there are 17... Okay, look, History Vanguard deserves more than 32 subscribers. You know, he, he, he putting out lots of good stuff here. Lots of good stuff. Seriously. Seriously. I will do some tweeting of your videos after I have finished this evening. I will tweet them out and push them as far as I can to help you. I'll try and see what we can chat about on Bilge Pumps as well. Paul is a war office move to put soldiers in France so they can pretend England's a continental power? Not really. The We'll get into the Entente Cordiale. We will. But... The whole point about this question is that it's going to have massive repercussions for the development of technology for the next 100 years. So it's worthwhile thinking about what would have happened if World War One's starting point had changed. Hey, that's good. Everyone, the Entente Cordiale becomes more of an alliance after Germany tries to break the Entente Cordiale in Morocco a few times. Threatening war pushes them together. The ships also don't help. Exactly. It doesn't help. Yes, it does make the, more, uh, the Entente Cordiale closer, but it still doesn't make it an alliance. If British government, and let's be honest, there are voices in the British government who would like to avoid war massively, had, had 
had an option to get out of it, they might well have been able to get out of it. No worries, Carver Gopos. Hal MC Legend 13 inch. Nice look. So ideally, Hood would have got 15 inch of these. Yes, and we can all imagine what would that have been. The RN always likes to go toward the biggest battleships ships going. Yes, they do. They really do. And to an extent, they need to. Because the British have a habit of biting off more than they can really chew. If you look at the stats, if you look at the raw information and data, on paper, Napoleon should win the Napoleonic Wars. If you look at the raw information and data in... 1939, Hitler doesn't actually have a chance of winning World War II, but we'll leave that to one side. Um, the fact he managed to hold up for so long is just, frankly, amazing. We'll leave that to one side, though. Uh, the whole German economy is an absolute mess. <laughs> oh, it's more full of hubris than anything else. Uh, but no. Sorry, I'm just... Don't know if I'm While talking to you all, I have just noticed the sheer amount of dog bags, let's say, I have opened and partially used on my desk. I'm not sure how I have managed to collect four of them, but I have. We'll be getting into that, but I, the picture I have chosen will tell you what I think would more likely have been built. So let's consider the sheaf of them plan. Now, the Sheathland Pan is interesting because it's all these hooks. Now, the German war plan, when it's taking place, is thinking about a world in which they are fighting France and they are fighting Russia. It's interesting to know it really doesn't think much about Britain in it. Why? Because in 1906, 1905, 1906, as far as Schlieffen was, uh, was concerned, Britain was not antagonised enough that they were likely to find themselves in a war with them. And in fact, Schlieffen probably would have thought that only a moron would antagonise Germany's most logical and viable ally, because he didn't really view Austria as a sensible partner. In fact, he thought Austria-Hungary was one step away from falling down as a pack of cards. He didn't really, uh, wasn't really keen on other options as well. But, the point is, this plan was to go through Belgium very quickly and deal with the French. Now, why is he going through Belgium? We'll get on to that in a bit. Why is this the scenario? Well, this is the plan that's worked for them before. In the Franco-Prussian War, it worked very well for them to attack France quickly and overwhelm it. They had done this before. They had beaten Napoleon III. And yes, the French had got a bigger and better army since then, but honestly, the Germans were looking at it and working out very quickly that the French commander control was still as nutty as ever. In fact, if you want to do something really interesting as a bit of a hobby, and I've got a friend who's writing a PhD on this, but you can do it personally without having to go into the level of detail they're going into. What can I say? She, The fact that she is... Well, uh, if I give this rough description of her. She's born and raised in a South American nation, but she has an American passport. She's studying the French command for, uh, command and construction forces, uh, command and control in three wars, the Franco-Prussian War, World War, I, uh, World War I and World War II, at the beginning of those three wars. And she's doing this in a Scottish university. That is the definition, I'm fairly sure, of a um, truly international perspective on history. But I was very fortunate. I was chatting with her at a conference. Ooh. Must have been last year sometime. And I've helped her a few documents since and she's helped me with a few documents and she's pretty good she's very good at doing the research in the French archives and the discussions I've had have broadly led me to the conclusion that the French go to war 
if they have time, they build up an excellent command and control system and the ability to run their forces brilliantly. And then the moment the war is over, their politicians start dismantling that for fear of their own armies. And the entire German war plan for, fr for fighting France usually is based off the knowledge that the French command and control system will disintegrate. And you can argue they based two world war, war they placed their battle plan, they based their entire battle plans of two world wars around fighting that command and control system which will disintegrate. Now, the problem with Schiffelin's plan, of course, was Tirpitz, who decided various, ne put through various navy laws and antagonized the British and turned the Anglo-German na naval race into a quantitative naval race. Now, please note, I've used this before in discussing naval races, and it's in the whole Dreadnought 1905 to 1914 series, which actually covers more like 1903 to 1916. We'll leave that to one side. The point is... There was a qualitative naval race going on between Britain, America, Japan, and Italy. Okay, they were each ra raising and going, Oh, we can build a battle battleship! We can build a better battleship! We can build a better battleship! And everyone was going, oh, There's a race going on! But the thing is about a qualitative naval race, is no one ever really gets that worried. Why? Because usually, everyone's building in quantities they can justify for their own needs. They're not justifying them on an aggressive basis. The moment you are a major land power who has a very small area of sea and only access to the world stage in global fleet terms is by going past the world's largest maritime power and naval power, start building a large fleet uh, and start saying you're building it because and actually you can open you're building it because of them so you are can you know you can stand up to them you start creating a problem a quantitative construction policy versus a qualitative one interesting enough the Americans are building not that fewer class of battle capital ships if we consider what the Americans are churning out. Yes, they're not getting quite near the numbers of the British, etc. But they're not building that small number. Then definitely not far behind the Germans in some regards, especially once you get later years run up to World War One. And um, yet it's a very different conversation. The, the conversation with the Americans isn't about who will destroy more of whose ships. It's whose ships are better than whose. And you notice how that's a different connotation. That's a different phraseology. That's a different nuance. And it, has, it takes an entirely different route. And... So the Schieflin plan in carried out in 1904, 1903, might well have succeeded. Would the British have been pissed off about Belgium? Yes, they would have. Would they have demanded the Germans immediately withdrew from Belgium after it was over? Yep. And if they hadn't, then there would have been war. Because Belgium matters. Why does Belgium matter to British security? Well... Napoleonic Wars and various other point things through history and fighting the Spanish during the Spanish Armada and all that stuff should tell you that the Bel Belgium and the Netherlands are important to the British because if you're going to invade the UK, William the Conqueror managed to pull it off, but pretty much any time else, if you want to invade the UK, you're going to need to come from certain areas. For Tide... For current and for wind reasons, i.e. all the stuff which makes crossing a sea actually viable, you're going to want to come from either the coast of Belgium or the coast of the Netherlands. The British, therefore, do not like a large continental power being in command of the Netherlands or Belgium. They like them being independent. <laughs> they do. It's a basic strategic necessity. If you want to invade Britain, you need to come from those coasts. Even today, you would still probably be best coming from those areas. 
So if Germany invaded and went through Belgium, they'd better leave it as intact as possible, and seeing as the plan required them not to damage the railways, etc., and to then be prepared to pay reparations to Belgium, and to withdraw as quickly as possible after they've beaten the French. Now, all those things are sort of nodded to in some of the discussions and drafts around the Schlieffen Plan. Sort of. Please note, there are many variations, there are many drafts, there are many discussions, and it's one of those plans where you can probably write almost anything about and find something which can substitute what, uh, substantiate what you're saying in it somewhere under discussions and the various officers going around. It especially goes through very, many variations with Von Mocke, who... How do I put this? Schlieffen is a far more daring tactician than Von Mocke is. Uh, but I would also add the Schlieffelin plan that requires you to put everything into that right wing punch. And it would work. It would have worked. I, I know there are people who go, it won't work, it won't work, and this sort of thing. If you consider the sheer. If you haven't got the BEF where they are. And the Battle of Mons doesn't happen. And if you haven't got a few other things that happen in that scenario, then honestly, it could well have worked. Basically, it needs a couple less things to occur and a couple more things to go right. Royal Ruta, I just graduated from a US Navy bootcamp last Friday. It's nice to finally be able to catch a live stream. Cool! Congratulations! I don't think they're different in the US than in the UK, um, considering we just buy them from, probably buy them from the same place. And honestly, I have so many on my desk because probably what happens is they're all stored, they're all normally stored in the, what well, in the kitchen. And I come into my office and I take the stuff out of my pockets when I sit down. And so I probably just leave them and forget to take them back there. And then when I take dogs on a walk, grab another pack. And the same happens over and over again. Because normally I stick them in this thing. So you're right, surely the 15 and 50s wouldn't have been ready until the early 20s. That's the thing. They'd actually been working on them for a long time. So... They would have been ready. Uh, honestly, they probably were ready. There's a debate as to whether they're ready in 1919. Uh, it's not. It's not a long time because they've been delayed by World War Two, uh, World War One. But they would have been ready before 1920. Would they have been? They would have been in a ship. <laughs> Please, no, I'm not. I'm not saying they'd have actually been. They'd be actually. It's kind of like putting the 14-inch quadruple together. You have the guns built, you have them in the ship, then you have to learn how to use them, okay? It, it's going to be a case of, well, by the time they're viable, you're probably in the 1920s, but, you know. My quality quality's not a threat. Throwing numbers out implies using them. Mm-hmm. The men see 30, uh, Legend 30 Ancient. Uh, France mentioned in the race because, let's be real, the rate they're building, it doesn't seem they're actually in the race. No, they are. They are a part of the race because, honestly, the Italians have to think about them when building. And the Germans also, to an extent, think about them occasionally when building. Usually when they want something to laugh at. And the Austrians. Austrians often think about the French when building. But most people don't really, who are actually building seriously, don't really worry about the French and their construction of dreadnoughts. <sighs> they were in the pre dreadnought naval race, but I haven't came in the dreadnought naval race. Mm -hmm. uh, 
No, it's like American. The plan for Germans to invade France is to confuse French high command and get them to employ themselves. No, usually it's because the German, uh, the French command and control structure will break down. So the Entente Cordiale, right then. So there's roughly three documents, okay? There are three documents. One document basically is about Egypt and Morocco. Basically, it says as long as the French do not get involved or interfere with British actions in Egypt, which means also the Lower Sudan and all the basically anywhere along the Nile, the British promise to allow the French to preserve order and provide assistance in Morocco. This is one of the reasons why the British get involved in Morocco. The Entente Cordiale actually specifically mentions Morocco. Okay, please note that. That is something someone already brought up earlier. Okay, the British, uh, Morocco, etc. The Entente Cordiale mentions Morocco. The British are guaranteeing the French can have Morocco, basically. Free passage through the Suez Canal is guaranteed, putting the Convention of Constantinople into force. But also, the French are for forbidden from erecting fortifications on the Moroccan coast. Wonder which part of the Moroccan coast? Anyone want to guess which part of the Moroccan coast the French aren't allowed to fortify? And there was a secret annex in it, in this first document, uh, which with the possibility of changed circumstances in the administration of either of the two countries. Mm hmm. The second document dealt with Newfoundland and the West and, and Central Africa. France giving up their rights, standing for the Treaty of Utrecht, over the western coast of Newfoundland, uh, although they retained the right to fish the coast. And Britain gave France the town of Yabutenda, which is now between the border of modern Senegal, uh, Senegal and Gambia. And uh, the Ilz de Los, which is part of Mon Guinea. Additional provisions uh, dealt with the border between the French and British positions, uh, possessions east of the River Niger. And that's present day Niger and Nigeria. And the final one concerns Siam, Madagascar, and New Hebrides, or. Thailand, Madagascar, and Vanatu, uh, Vanuatu. In Siam, Britain recognises the French sphere of influence to east of the Menem River Basin, that's the Shao Prea, and the French recognise the British influence over territory to the west of the Menem Basin. They uh, eventually both decide they won't annex Siamese territory. And the British withdrew their objection to the French introducing a tariff in Madagascar. And um, they came to an agreement which is so beautifully phrased, it's so, so Victorian imperialistic, to end difficulties arriving from the, arising from the lack of jurisdiction over the natives of the New Hebrides. What do you notice about this agreement? Well, it's not an alliance, is it? And in fact, it's very carefully not an alliance. And that's all negotiated in 1904. Now, please note, between 1898 and 1901, when Joseph Chamberlain had been first been hunting around for a first British alliance, I know, we ally with the Anglo, there's the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty, and that's the first big alliance for both nations. It's the first peacetime alliance for Britain, and it's a major one for Japan. Well, actually, that wasn't the first nation Britain went to. That was Germany. Britain had been considering allying with Germany because of Russia. Because, honestly, Russia are that annoying and that problematic for them. Now, the Entente itself comes about not because of Germany. It's 1904. Well before the naval race. The Entente comes about because the British and the French are worried about finding themselves fighting a war... Because of the Russo-Japanese War! Yes! The Russians and the Japanese keep looking like they're going to fight and end up do fighting in 1905. Oh, lovely. But 
Battle of Toshima, everyone. That's fun. Well, the Russo-Japanese War, when it happens, the British and the French thought they could get sucked into a war because their two allies were kept looking like they were going to fight. So instead of having a fight, they thought they'd make things as equally and friendly as between each other as possible. So then there was unlikely to be any reason for them to get sucked into the war. Hence, they have these agreements. But to, whilst uh, Fiafal de Classe always felt that the agreements, this was an alliance, just the British being British, you know, perfidious Albion uh, didn't want to call an alliance. The British, and this is one of the diplomats who was involved in the negotiations, said, The fundamental fact, of course, is that the Entente is not an alliance. For the purpose of ultimate uh, emergencies, it may be found to have no substance at all. For the Entente is nothing more than a frame of mind, a view of the general policy, which is shared by governments of two countries, which may be or become so vague as to lose all content. That matters. Basically, it means the British government have got wiggle room. Man of Pfizer, uh, Panzer, I will get into that sort of question of France and all this sort of Russia later on. Uh, I, I know you have a good question. It's a good question, but I need to... Uh, let's put it this way. I don't want to jump too far ahead because I have to explain as I'm going because... Otherwise, what happens sometimes when I answer some of the questions we're going is that then people start writing comments because they watch a certain a certain place in the video, and then they start basically going they're going off because I've said something, and I've not substantiated it because I haven't explained it as I've been going, and um, because it's before I reach that point, uh, and I basically have to go back to some of the comment which is just watch the whole video. And that just, it almost feels rude for me to have to say that back to them. But basically, that's what I need to say to them. Because they're just, they're, they're all points I answer further along in the video. Alright, if you're developing 15 cities and they have ready by 1918-19, you'll probably have a bunch of Admiral Improved Admiral derivatives armed with them. How well armoured they would be without Jutland? Interesting question. Oh, Seam Richards, the 16 inches were chosen out of the 50 uh, because of status. They, they wanted to build 16 inch battleships because the Japanese and the Germans had. Japanese and the Americans had 16 inch battleships. It was entirely an ego thing. Uh, Paul from Chicago, it wasn't the sign in those days, it was the Daily Mail. Mr. Friends, so Entente Cordial is a general understanding of sorts. You will not do this, and I will not do this to you. And you get these things, and I will get these things. That's my understanding of it. Pretty much. Hi, Glenn. Glenn, I'm going to ask this one. Have you got your writing done? Because you need it. I know you need to be writing. You told me last night you needed to be writing. I think the RN is moving heavier armor anyway because of the arms race of the Americans. It's well, remember, it's a qualitative race with the Americans. So honestly, what I see it as going on, please note, if World War One doesn't break out when it is, uh, it's the interesting. I think the R's are of the generation of battleships after the R's will be a continuation of the start thing start on the Queen Elizabeth. So be looking at a fast battleship. So I think you would have that sort of thing develop. Maybe some battle cruisers as well. You probably have a mixture. And the British will be going for the basically the ultimate ship. And it'll probably be a fast battleship. So it'll probably have Queen R class sort of armor, but might have triple turrets and it. we get into all this in Long Patrol. But no. The Entente Cordiale, the point to remember is it's 
It's an alliance if all parties involved say it is. But if one party says it's not, the other party doesn't really have anything to force them. There is no coercion. There is no, there is no use of the word alliance in it. It gives both parties wiggle room. Thank you, Ruhan. One on half speed listening to me is a trip. I hope it's a good one with in flight service. So, what is the German plan if they don't invade Belgium? Well, in the Franco Prussian War, the Germans had kind of charged through and taken over most of France. Um. So the French reacted as they normally do in these circumstances. They start building forts. And they built them all around Verdun and that sort of area to provide protection for France. They, of course, lost Alsace and Lorraine, but they are building these forts to protect them. Protect themselves. This is the problem. This is the basic problem. The reason why, you'll notice in this one, the Franco-Prussian War, the Germans do not invade Belgium. They do not touch Belgium. Why? Because if you touch Belgium, you're going to piss off the British. She's the French there. You're going to annoy the British. And that's not something the Germans want to do. Why? Because the British, when they get involved, have a habit of being annoying. See, the British tend to have one thing, which is... The British don't have a lot of people. They don't have a large army. What do they tend to have? A lot of strategic mobility and a lot of money. That's how Britain wins wars. They pay other people to do, spend the blood, and they spend the treasure. There is this whole thing, the American lesson that comes out of the American Civil War is better to expend things rather than people. The British have learnt this over a long period of time. They prefer to expend money than people. Because people can earn more money. Money can't earn more people. Done, Rick. Don't jump ahead too much. So... You cannot go through this line of fortifications. And the Germans know this. In fact, if we go back to the Schieffeln plan, you will see some arrows here. Those arrows are the French battle plan, which the Germans knew. The Germans knew the French weren't going to go through Belgium. And so the French were supposed to, uh, they, were, they were going to let the French go into their own areas and with a minimal force possible, hold them up, delay, defend, uh, defend them. And basically the idea was to trap the entire French army away from France and defeat it in detail. That's the idea. And that's the plan. So what's your option? Well, if you're not going for Belgium, why not Switzerland? Because, frankly, if you have to pick any nation to not invade, you pick Switzerland. A. They might be very, have a large Germanic population who are very pro-Germany. They do. But that population is even more pro-Swiss. And they do not like people coming in and mucking around with Switzerland. So we love Switzerland and do not try and invade it. Please, Switzerland, don't take this out on me. Because they tend to have such an aggressive form of neutrality, they have been known to bash people over the head with it. And when I say bash people over the head of it, they bash people over the head with their rifle of neutrality and their heavy artillery of independence, freedom, and we're neutral. Do you understand we're neutral? Yes, you crossed into our territory. We've blown you up. You understand how neutral we are. There are other powers in this world who you could probably wander through and not have any problems. Switzerland will not take any prisoners. Unless you wander in surrendering straight away. So, going south, not an option. 
but there are forts, so you have to go around them. So you go through Belgium, but the whole point of this question is Germany does not invalid Belgium. So before I can answer this question or start talking about this, I need to work out how does Germany do the Schlieffeln plan or something like it, this hook around, without invading Belgium. Well, there are two options to consider, really. One, you turn the counterattack into your battle strategy. So you base your entire battle street on a strategy on sucking in the G French army as much as possible into Germany, then encircling, wiping it out, and then going back down the route it's come. That is a possibility, but that is going to mean a lot of damage in the Ruhr Valley in various parts of Germany, which you do not want damaged because they're your industrial heartland. So it's not possibly a sensible idea. Plus, allowing someone in there, in that far in there, leaves the possibility that if your plan goes wrong, they're mostly in your country already and you're going to lose. So, here's the other option for getting around them. Hamburg America Line and the North German Lloyd or Nord Deutsche Lloyd lines are the two of the largest liner lines in the world. Their largest shipping lines in the world. Two of the largest at this time. And you have to remember Germany has funded the growth of their liners and their liner force largely through immigration. Okay? So the British, of course, had Irish immigrating to America, and that had quite, had quite a lot of liners paid for to uh, take the people across America to America. But um, there were a lot of Eastern Europeans who wanted to go to America as well. And when they turned up at the German border, well, the German border posts for dealing with these sort of through immigrants were actually run by these companies. The German state had sold them the contract, had awarded them the contract to run them so basically if you were traveling with them you got through the border real easy if you weren't well you'd get held up at the border by the way if anyone wants to think this is a version of human trafficking it is it's legal but it's what's going to the time it's and mostly they were taking russian and ukrainian and eastern european or even uh, even a fair number of um Polish and uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, well, Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian uh, people who wanted to leave the area, and they would turn up at these border posts, they would get shuttled through, and they'd get put in the liners. And this led to the Germans having a massive majority of the liners in service. The British had a vast merchant fleet, the largest merchant fleet in the world. Most of the British fleet were trampers. That's merchant vessels which are slightly slower but designed to sail around pretty much the whole world and take all sorts of supplies and they carry a very few number of people but a lot of good a lot of vo a large volume of goods fairly efficiently and cheaply. Liners are designed to be fast, carry a large volume of people and goods. So, yeah, I'm talking about an amphibious operation. Instead of you doing the hook through Belgium, you go around Belgium. You can't go through Switzerland. As I've said, the counterattack sucker strategy doesn't really work for the Germans because of what's behind that they'd have to be fighting in. So, this is an option. And a sucking condition in battle that goes against all the traditions of the German army. Um, the German army always attacks even when it should, as Centino puts it. Yeah, there is definitely that. Hello, DH89. High concentrationness. The Blue Ribbon was a big prize for liners. But you have to remember the Blue Ribbon is another contest of almost the Anglo-German naval race. And the Americans get involved as well because the Blue Ribbon just seems to be just prize up for grabs and it's status. And the Blue Ribbon of course prize is for those who have the fastest liner able to do the fastest transatlantic crossing. 
Now, don't get me wrong, this is not an easy thing. If you are talking about the sheer number of personnel which the Germans are planning to use to invade through Belgium, even with their entire fleet of liners, they are going to not be shifting all of it in one go. However, it's also not a massive distance from uh, down the coast of the Netherlands and Belgium to get to northern French ports. It depends which ports you pick, but it's not a massive distance. And if you've managed to sucker the Germans into invading, or sucker the French, I mean, into invading and into going into that part of the territory you want, the French army will be on a completely the opposite side of the country. And because you don't have troops building up, because you could have the troops organising the other side of the Kiel Canal on the Belgian border, it would look like you were organising for that defensive battle. It would look totally like you were organising for the defensive battle, or you were even organising that army to go and beat the Russians. You're planning that massive force to go strike the Russians. There are lots of reasons why intelligence, if they pick up where you're garrisoning and where you're forming up your troops and you're mobilizing your troops to, would presume that you were not going to do this. And of course, the important thing is, you're not invading Belgium. You are not invading Belgium. Which is going to make Belgium rather happy, and the Netherlands rather happy. It's going to make operation in the North Sea a lot more difficult, because you can have a multiplication of unaligned powers in any conflict. But this war also can't go along. Now, I can imagine Jones forcing their way through like this. Uh, hello, we are all navy. Hello, we are all navy. What are you doing? Not invading Belgium, but France. Carry on. Um, there, it becomes an interesting. It becomes an interesting option. Now, there are reasons for this. The logistics and etc. this is going to be very complicated. However, there are going to be differences with Gallipoli. One, this will be an army-run plan. There is no way the Navy will get to be in charge of it. Middle Eastern Navy should be in charge of it, but let's be honest, the Army will be running it. So, it will have a centralised chain of command. Two, unlike Gallipoli, there will be no random turning up beforehand to tell the enemy you're coming. You're coming. Expect the high seas fleet and the convoy of troops to arrive off the French Canal coast at the same time, escorted by a plethora of destroyers, etc. Secondly, I mean thirdly, the French army is not going to be in the right place. And French, uh, France has defences, yes. Please note, I'm not saying their coastline is entirely undefended. No, it's got some good fortifications and protections along it. But has it got anything that can stand up to the sheer might and combined firepower of the high seas fleet? No. Because it's not supposed to. Because the French were as they did when they were building them. All these lines of fortifications, etc. had cheaped out based on the promises of the Entente Cordiale that they perceived were there. Like they cheaped out on the defensive lines in leading up to World War II. As we all know, I've discussed before, those lines do not go all the way across. They do not go to the sea, from Switzerland to the sea. No, no, no. They, when they get close to Belgium, they peter out because Belgium's forts to protect them. Well, that's economically great for you, because it means you have to spend less money. But ultimately, it's stupid, because it means you're depending on someone else filling in the gaps for you. Yeah. My goodness, if the Germans 
pull, uh, pull this off, a successful amphibious operation in World 1. There were many successful amphibious operations in World 1. We only remember Gallipoli because it was the biggest and most farcical. There were actually some decent and effective ones. Then you have another problem. The British government. Asquith is mercurious at best when it comes to war. He doesn't really want it. In fact, no one wants it, of course, but he doesn't really want it to defend the French because he's worried about the Russians and India, and he thinks we're going to end up fighting the Russians at some point, so keep being allied with the French is problematic. But he is enough of a francophone, he also doesn't want to see the French fall. Doxon, I know I'm the latest party, but would the Germans never not consider not invading France? I mean, they don't have to, right? Well, I would point out the Germans have to inv are invading France because the, if they um, the the Franco German uh, the Franco Russian alliance, if you end up at war with Russia, you automatically end up at war with France. If you end up at war with France, you end up at war with Russia. They actually have an alliance with Britain. It's an entente cordiale with the uh, the Franco Russians. It's an alliance. Mother 5, Susan, didn't Belgium say they would ally with Germany if they continue the Maginot line across the Belgian border? Uh, there are all sorts of different politicians in Belgium who sort of say this, but again, if the Belgians ally with Germany, why does that matter so much to the French? This is going to sound strange, but again, the Belgians, uh, if you, uh, Belgians, if you consider what happened hmm, previously... Pan fans, in regards to naval operation, the train Jones will be marching through isn't hilly compared to something like Akiba. No, it isn't. It's far better ter terrain for um, go for going through. It is a uh, very, very interesting terrain. So you have Asquith, who is also at this point Secretary of State for War. You have the Chancellor and the power behind the throne, David Lloyd George who is very anti-war because he doesn't want to spend the money. Remember, this is a government which has been committed to spending the money it is on the fence as deterrence. They've been ramping up the spending to try and deter conflict, not because they want to fight one. It's just not good. It's not sensible what's going on. Then we have Winston Churchill, looking rather dapper there in his younger days as First Lord of the Admiralty. Now, he's probably the most francophone of all of them. And is the most encouraged to see the Entente Cordiale as an actual alliance rather than as something else. But then we have Sir Edward Grey and we have Reginald McKenna. They are not anti the French. Please, this is one of the things that comes from the French. But they're not so pro the French either. They are more on the, we would prefer to be allied with the Germans because, frankly, we're worried about the Russians' camp. McKenna is especially interesting to me. He is possibly the least likely to be such a powerful figure. But he is... He is. He takes over as Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's a former First Lord of the Admiralty. He would take over Chancellor of the Exchequer from David Lloyd George under Asquith. And it's quite interesting. He basically swaps and becomes Home Secretary after Churchill leaves the Admiralty. He is a hard-working gentleman but he is very much not keen 
very much not keen on a war. Now, therefore, if you don't have an invasion of Belgium, there is certainly a large group in the government, in parliament, in the cabinet, who would seize on that to make the case for not fighting the Germans. Francophone speaks French, Francophile. Eh, probably not. But also they were the ones who could speak French. <laughs> Please note, not all these men could speak French. <laughs> some could, some could not. And I would also add that the finest orator in this group, Lloyd George, and he is the finest orator at this point by a country mile, is probably the most ambivalent about the idea of war in terms of not wanting to get involved. Take care, Amelia Barra. Sorry, I've been growing tea. The problem with this is assuming that even ignoring the French religion, the British could let any power control the canal. channel. You need to stop. Uh, this is a point I'm going to get to, Ferdinand. This is a point I'm going to get to. But if you do not invade Belgium, German logistics will be harder because Belgium very good railways going between Germany and France. That will all adjust lower the number of supplies you're getting. Yes, but ultimately you're using the sea and you're using French railways you capture yourself. Lone Thompson, what Netherlands protected by alliance? All that little coastline could have been useful to the Kaiser's SMS toys while surrounding Belgium and not pulling in the British Empire. Again, it was a decided that they thought they could get away with Belgium because they didn't invade the Netherlands. They thought that would be enough of a sop to British strategic security that that would be okay. So, so did Winston Churchill sending the fleet to Scapa on 27th, if I remember correctly? Well, change the German calculations. Um, I'll be getting into that again on this. The king believed that Germany was a threat, and it was better to fight them with the French on side than if the French had been humbled. The king is someone in the background, but you have to again remember the king's power can be overstated. If the prime minister decides not to invade and not to invade, not to fight, they honestly the king can't do much. Constitutional monarchy. The king can be annoyed with you. The king can't to can knock your head off. Thompson, the British had an obligation to intervene for Belgium. Did they have an obligation to protect the Netherlands? No, but they do have a traditional alliance with the Dutch. They don't have an alliance of note with the Dutch, but they have a traditional alliance of friendship with the uh, Dutch. Invading the Netherlands is never a good policy if you want to have the British be happy with you. Remember, the British were key to helping the Spanish be kicked out of the Netherlands because they didn't, well, the English were, because they didn't want the Spanish in control of the Netherlands because they didn't want them to use it to invade Britain or England. Anyway. So. Now, on top of that, you have to consider what the British actually have in the channel. This is usually an interesting point where I go, well, there's no channel barrier. There isn't. Not at this point. Because I've had discussions about this before. There is the Harch Force under Rear Admiral Turret, who is quite well known. Quite a good naval officer. And there is the Channel Fleet under Vice Admiral Sir Lewis Bailey. Who famously, um, when the ships are being activated, is called up and offered to go to the Grand Fleet. And after he's all organised them all and is said, oh, do you want to go to the Grand Fleet to have a squadron now? And he said, at this time of decision, I will not leave the men and men I have organised behind. Please note, there is a squadron listed here, which are listed as armoured cruisers. 
The seventh cruiser squadron. The Cressies. They have the 5th and 8th Battle Squadrons, which are roughly 16 what I would call Sovereign-type battleships. Um, Pre-Dreadnoughts in standard parts. 5th uh, Squadron. I haven't got a full list of 8 Squadrons numbers, but 5th Squadron included HMS Prince of Wales, HMS Bulwark, HMS Implacable, HMS Irresistible, HMS Formidable, HMS London, HMS Queen, and HMS Venerable. This is not a massive force. So this is your other problem. Please note, if you decide to get involved in the channel, what do you have to fight it with? And I'll tell you now, you cannot magically go, we're bringing the Grand Fleet back. They've been sent up. The Grand Fleet are in their wartime positions for part of the distant blockade. No one expects the Germans to do a run on the channel. Everyone's sort of treating this as a deterrence exercise. There's all these things going on in the West. We're in wartime positions. But that means the fleet isn't there. Now, if the Germans come out at speed heading for the channel, the idea is these forces are supposed to hold them up while the Grand Fleet comes down behind them. But these forces are not what they're going to be in 1915, 1916. And these forces are certainly not, do not have the minefields and other barriers they have to back them up in later in the war. They have nothing. All they have is these ships. And if you bring everything of the German fleet, and I'm talking all the dreadnoughts, all the those fast ships, and you have all the pre-dreadnoughts you can grab coming up behind with a second convoy, you will have such a large force coming towards you that's a point of consideration. So please note, you already have a divided cabinet who don't have the Casus Belli they can all link around the invasion of Belgium. They've all agreed on, if Belgium is invaded, we go to war because we cannot afford the German control of Belgium. And you also have this scenario, where they're looking at it, the forces they actually have to withstand an attack on the channel are this. So it's very easy to say, and simple to say, the British will never tolerate another power going into the channel. And you're right, they wouldn't like it. But if you're going to resist with this force, you have to be prepared for the fact that every single one of these ships will be destroyed. The Grand Fleet is sort of split between sort of different areas at this point. They're heading for Scarpa Flow and they're mostly going to be there. Yes, but Queen Elizabeth II is kind of a, um, how do I put this? She has advantages of being around for a long, long time and having slightly more influence than possibly a better, slightly better running system than possibly some of her predecessors as well. So, what are the options? Well, there's a range of options we can discuss. There are a range of options. It's don't get involved or have a massive battle in the channel. The range of options boil down to that. It, you can it choose to ignore, not get involved. You can keep your fleet back, and you let the Germans do what the Germans are going to do. The British could not mine the English Channel quickly enough. They could put some mines there if they wanted to, but 
they can't mine it quickly enough. For starters, they need to procure the mines. Now, the minefields were laid between Belgium and Dover from the outbreak of World War One, But it wasn't quick to unload them. We're talking weeks slash months, really. And, um... It was only in February 1915 that 25 kilometres of indicator nets were added to it, that's steel netting, anchored to the uh, seabed, and, um, well, on the 4th of March 1915, the first German U-boat, U-8, was taken caught in the indicator nets. It's a it's a whole thing. Take care, see you, Samuel. Lost a lot of ships' lives now, or wait, but to build even more and wait for a better time to let the air out of the Kaiser. It's not a good op. There are no good options. Okay, this is the first thing I want to say this. There are no good options, and that's what this cabinet would be having to deal with. And this is going to have an effect on the Royal Navy. But the effect can be very different. So we'll start off with the effect that is most likely. And then, by the way, my plan for this evening is to go through these slides and then have a discussion session. So... I'll just have the slides going behind me while we answer the qu we discuss the questions and go through it because I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. Hence, I'm being slightly quick going through the slides, quicker than I normally go through slides. No battle. The British don't get involved. Well, the Entente dies. Okay, the Entente dies at that point. Germany probably succeeds in landing. Maybe even succeeds with a plan. They won't be able to take as many troops, and they have more difficulties with logistics. But they also there won't be the BEF there. They will be taking the French by surprise from the rear, and there will be a large number of troops landing, and they can keep up the flow of their liners. But you have to remember at this point they've not just trailed their battle fleet, but also a mass amphibious invasion force off the coast of Britain. So whilst France likely falls before the end of 1914, if they fall, that, that, that would probably happen, the odds are the British government changes. I would presume that David Lloyd George becomes Prime Minister. I would presume under those circumstances. And that's going to change the calculations again. But Asquith would certainly fall. If you don't get involved now, you're going to have to probably you're going to probably have to reinforce heavily because if you don't fight, who's to say the Germans won't plan invasion of Britain in the same manner? After all, you force the channel once. This I will get into again, Verdun. You're you're jumping ahead. That's long-term consequences. Short-term consequences. The Entente, as said, dies, and the government falls. And the British would need to react. And if you think Britain was scared when they had the submarine scare and the invasion scares of before the Napoleonic period, you have no idea how scared they would be at this point. As Verdun has just pointed out, a massive naval force there. 
well, it's going to have consequences. I would say, under this scenario, H missing and parable is quite likely. Or something like it. And I can say an Everest would start again, but I also think you'd have a massive building of fortifications around the UK to defend against potential landing. Stephen Richard, surely Germany wouldn't have gone for a massive battle in the Channel. The point I would make about this is, and the reason we go back to this as an actual viability, okay, you have to remember the Kaiser believes the British won't get involved. And you go with this plan if you think the, the British won't get involved. If you think the British have given you the green light. So we can argue about the logic of it, but no one really wants to fight a battle in confined spaces. But this is quite a possibility of this. You're dealing with a lot of egos. At this point, the British have chosen not to fight in this scenario. So there's no battle. Long-term consequences are there is still going to be a war. <laughs> there will still be a war in Europe. And the actual thing is, after losing the war, whilst the French will have less trust in the British, they'll be even more forced to rely upon the British, because who are those? Who else is another option? What other option do they have as a potential ally? Because, let's be honest, Russia will get knocked out. The Russian army has reformed and has improved since uh, the Russo-Japanese war, but as we all know, and French loans have paid for miles and miles of railway and other improvements, but still, the Russian army get, will get knocked out by the Germans. Especially if the French are no longer fighting. Good news is, if it's uh, quicker, than, if the, uh, the French are already knocked out and the Russians might well be convinced to sue for peace earlier, which might mean that the Russian government doesn't fall, but they're going to be in problems. So you're even more dependent upon the British. I would argue you probably get a major war in the 1920s. And it will make World War One look like a walk in the park. Because... It'll be just as inexperienced and unworldly as World War One in its application of devastating technologies. And you would have to build a far larger Royal Navy, by the way. And this is the thing, the Royal Navy would have to be built larger because they'd want to have a, str squ a fleet strong enough in the channel that this didn't happen again. Does does really command waters the channel? Does it offset the advantage of Dreadnought-type battleships over Sovereign-type battleships? Uh, you still have a lot more armour on a Dreadnought-style battleship. But you're also fighting at close enough ranges that the directed fire possibly um, isn't necessarily overwhelming. But I let me let me put it off answering that question because honestly, I've got to get to the point. And this is I know I'm saying this a lot in this video, and I, I I thought I would be, which is why I structured this video the way I have done, so we could have a long discussion afterwards. But there is another option. A massive battle in the channel. Now, how does that happen? Well, let's start off with this. I have run it a few times in Harpoon, in my variation of Harpoon on my laptop, and I am going to be putting it on the PC at some point. The odds of anything of the channel fleet surviving are very low. Some of the crew survive, some of the ships might well manage to beach themselves, but they're gone. The thing is, them and the French forces buy enough time for the Grand Fleet to come down behind the Germans. Please note that. The Grand Fleet to come down behind the Germans. Now, yes, the, Royal, the Grand Fleet is in two places. They're in the... Uh, there's some in Northern Ireland, and there's some at Scalpel Flow, and various other places around. A large number are at Scalpel Flow, and up in North of England. 
the north of Scotland, north of Scotland. So they're coming down from there. But there's also some coming from other directions. The Germans, now, sensible uh, sensibility would be the moment you engage the Channel Fleet and realise the British are going to fight, you withdraw. And that is an option. You withdraw, you fight the Channel Fleet, you're off, and you withdraw, knowing what's coming next. But, if you have a big enough ego, and if you're fighting and overwhelming the Channel Fleet, and you're getting through, you might well just push on. And that's where the real big losses start to come in. Because the Grand Fleet coming in from behind means they'll probably hit the pre-dreadnoughts and the second stage convoy first. And they won't have anywhere to run. And by the time the German dreadnoughts, the high seas fleet and the rest of the convoy hear what's coming on, they're coming their way, they're going to be well and truly down the channel. Which means that you get a fight at close quarters. Now, close quarters fight is not what, not a good scenario for anyone. Please do not think anyone's coming out of this well. The Germans can't get home. So their losses are 90% plus. Ships either sunk or beached on French or British coasts. Crews in the water scattered. It is terrible, okay? It is really, really not a good scenario for the Germans. But. It's also not good for the British. You're fighting at close quarters. You're fighting confined spaces. The British losses are some region in terms of shipping 60 to 70 percent. Mainly because the ships which don't get there. Which do get, can do it. Can get to shore. Can get to a harbour. Because there's the channel. The bases and the French bases. Not just, just nearby. You can get into them. Okay, so you can get repaired, you can get saved. But it is not good. Okay, if you want a good example of this, you have the fact that in World War II, now battle cruisers are designed to easily shrug off cruiser fire, but in World War II, battle cruisers, which have been upgraded to the point at which you can sort of start considering them to be fast battleships, I'm talking about some of the Japanese Congos, get taken out by American heavy cruisers at close range. Because it doesn't matter. Okay, those guns are far more powerful than the 8-inch guns of World War One, but that isn't the matter. What matters is they're at such close range. They're at such close range, it doesn't matter because the penetrating capability of those guns at close range. Point blank in naval terms. And if you're fighting in the channel with fleets the size of the Grand Fleet and the High Seas Fleet and a whole host of transports and merchant shipping and people going around on those vessels, it is going to be close quarters and it is going to be a massacre. And the police point this out. The German plans for the invasion of France through Belgium was some in the region of 70 to 80% of their army was supposed to be going that way. So let's say they send equivalent numbers and in their cha in the, on their ships. They tr load them up to as full as they can because they're only going, not going a long distance so they don't have enough quarters for them to sleep. They're just standing room only, packed, as heavy as, uh, uh, packed and overloaded as they can be. You could be talking about that entire army being killed or taken prisoner in the battle. Torpedo boats would also be an effective thing in this battle, but remember the torpedo boats would also be facing Leviathan spewing rapid-firing guns at them. Okay, so as, ex as capable as they can be, they're not going to be as they're also going to be sh facing sheer volume of fire and destroyers going around. There's going to be everything going there torpedoes, guns, the lot. Now, in both these scenarios, the war ends by Christmas because if the entire high seas fleet and all that army are wiped out in a battle in the English Channel, Germany does not carry on fighting. Germany doesn't. Both these scenarios have different effects on the Royal Navy. One leads to a new naval arms race, and probably incomparable. 
The other one, I would argue, leads to a Royal Navy being rebuilt, but also a Royal Navy which doesn't have to compete with the Royal Air Force, because there is no Royal Air Force, and a Royal Navy which doesn't have to compete with the Army either, because, well, there's a very simple reason. They will have a new Nelson. They'd have had a new Battle of Trafalgar. Yes, they'd have lost a humongous amount of people, an ab absolutely massive amount of people doing it. But there would be a new Nelson. And please note, this could be a full Nelson transformation. Um, the analysis I ran, I did 20, 20 runs through on Harpoon. In 12 of those, both Beatty and Jellico died. In 17 of those, Beatty died. In 14 of them, Jellico died. In only one did both Jellico and Beatty come out alive. Now, the point is, one of the reasons why the numbers are so big is because if the Germans can't get home, they're going to go down fighting. The Germans are not going to surrender. They're not that type. There's no navy which is really full of that type. But there are some navies which have a more pragmatic approach to their own, own personal survival than others. So, this is like fighting a wounded animal, a wounded cornered animal. And that is what you're going to be fighting. And the Brit for the British, well, it's fighting a naval battle in the Channel to defend our, uh, defend their home. Because as far as their crews could be concerned, those amphibious ships could be going to the UK. They could be going to France. Could going either way. So what are the long-term consequences? Well, the whole point is Tirpitz might turn around and go, well, look, we've cost the British this much. They now will weaken wood and power. True, but the British have just launched a, pro a system where they're building eight battleships. They've got pretty much 14 battleships under construction. They will order another eight. They will order another eight. Yes, there goes a lot of experience, but you also have to remember the, re the reason the Royal Navy have the Director's Naval Construction, the reason they have people like J Sir Julian Corbett, the reason why they have the system they do in place so they don't lose the experience if they have a massive loss. Coastal batteries, any present in the scenario. There are probably coastal batteries trying to get involved in this fight, but there, there is a problem with the coastal batteries getting involved. A, the sheer number of fire, ships firing, and also once you've got that much smoke and that much engagement at such close range, the odds are the coastal batteries can't pick out who's friend and who's foe. So the coastal batteries will not be involved in the fight for long. This is going to affect the Royal Navy. It's going to affect the Royal Navy in a lot of ways. Uh, think of it, if you don't have the long development of World War I, you probably don't have aviation development like it does, but also naval aviation is going to take a while to kick off. We might not see carriers until the late 1920s. Again, Mark Harness is the British fight. The losses are the hard, but Japan looks and says we are wise to have Britain as an ally. That is something else. You also, this is a point which you have to consider. The British Navy would be mauled, but the French Navy would also be mauled. And who's really going to turn around and start attacking them? There's, the whole point of Tirpitz was that someone else would come and attack them. Is America suddenly going to go? <gasps> British Navy's weak. Charge! Well, if they do that, they're going to have to fight the Japanese as well. Because the odds are the British will call the Japanese, and the Japanese would love to get hold of the American territories in the Philippines. And the Americans do not want to fight the British at this point, because the British will be rebuilding. Again, there are 14 battleships under construction at the beginning of World War One. 
So the British lose them, but they are fought all in the process of being commissioned. There are 14, six, 14, 16 battleships in the various processes. The Royal will try and rush out as many as they can. So you probably will have all eight R's and the six Queen Elizabeths built. A naval gunfire will hit land targets as well. There will be devastation up and down the coast. Robert, was the Royal Navy able to Copenhagen the crisis of the Marine Rain Point, or might they realistically have done so to war went on longer? Um, they probably could have in 1912. There are options that looked at it at that point, but probably not. As war went on, and as they developed, started naval developed naval aviation, especially some of the plans with sort of cuckoos, they could have done. So, uh, they could have Tarantoed. Um, well, the the full Taranto plan, which was to go in and goad them with torpedo bombers to come out and attack them. Thank you, Jack Ray. Five memberships gifted. Thank you. What would the USA do in the aftermath? Well, that's... That's a problem for the USA. What do they do in the aftermath? Why are they building the battleships they're building? Their own status, their own position. And I'm wondering, what were the battlecruiser losses in the battle? Uh, in this battle, what was the reaction loss of those ships? When you're losing so many ships, the battlecruisers don't stick out so much. And as said, honestly, in and I don't know how it managed to do this, but in the, the point is. Most of the battle cruisers still alive were not the ones there. If you're a battle cruiser and you weren't in this battle, you were fine. If you were in this battle, you were not in good. Sh you were not in good shape, broadly speaking. Please note, I'm saying broadly speaking. Because there is one battle cruiser which, according to my stats, survived every single one of the engagements. Anyone want to guess which battle cruiser? And by the way, which battle cruiser survived? And actually, what in one of those things was the sole surviving working British capital ship. Anyone want to guess what in one of those scenarios was the sole surviving? Yes. New Zealand. I do not know how it even did. It even did it on Harpoon. This game it is not supposed to be affected by the magic. I don't know how. Doesn't okay. I agree, but you're not going to tell me that with 80% casualties, replacement organization is going to be the same quality as original group. I mean, no army survived that by 1945. Uh, no, it's not going to be the same. My father got relegated to training post, and he told me our effects of 90% casualties was as an institution. I mean, they suffered more casualties by accidents than battle at one point. The thing is, they're going to have to rebuild. But they're also not going to be fighting a war that much longer, because let's be honest, the war will be over very quickly. The Germans are not going to be able to wage war losing that much of their army and that much of their, and their entirety of their navy, are they? So the Germans will surrender and war will be over, which means it's a rebuilding in peacetime. And you also... You're going, you have to remember, yes, you've lost those ships and crews, but you've also maintained the ships and crews which were part of the commissioning ships, the personnel who were already spread around various points, and you have to remember the British have squadrons all around the world. We're also, you have to consider there's forces in the Mediterranean, forces over in the South Atlantic, all etc. around the world. So there's a lot of spaces where there's a lot of institutional memory left, but the British will probably have to call all that in. So, people like Craddock would get called home. Everyone would be called home. Italy doesn't enter the war. Austria-Hungary survives. Poland stays divided. Yes. If 
Well, listen, would the British have adopted a disposition similar to the armed neutrality patrols and the Spanish of the war to avoid a massacre of this magnitude? Well, that is another of the options. That is another of the options going through. But that option, if the Germans decide to push through it, could still lead to a fight. Um, yeah. Look, in one of the... It, it was... Um, HMS... Uh, the, the scenario where only HMS New Zealand was left, that was... That was something, honestly, was quite horrific to read the fact casualties figures of. But under that scenario, uh, New Zealand gets split off from the rest of the battle cruisers for some reason, and she survives. Oh, yeah, she's dealing with... Some of the try to make a break. And she goes off after them, and then she comes back. And so she's in a different position. And... Um, Oh, some, yeah, okay. It's a bit like Reserve Army. The German Memorial is over there, Autumn nineteen forty four. Some good news in there, used not so wisely. Maybe a bad comparison. It's you have to remember how big the Royal Navy is in this period, just how big, and how many reservists they have, and how much. But still, there is going to be a lot of people dead. Okay, there are a lot of people dead. What will the, the global reactions be to Britain losing 67% of its home fleet? Well, who is going to do those opportunistic land grabs? Is it going to be the French? Who the British have just saved? Probably not. Is it going to be the Italians? Again, probably not. Because, think about that. Where are the next powers down? The only power you've got who could possibly do it is going to be America. And the British are allied with the Japanese for a reason. And I think the British public and Brit naval internal direction of the two big battles might make an interesting video. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't think I've done an actual video on that yet, but I'll think about it, though. Um, even just in British territorial waters, there are those that amount narrows the channel down enough that could cause trouble. If you try to pursue the aggressive neutrality like Switzerland does in British territorial waters. There is a chance of survival for the crews in the narrow confinements of the channel, but you also have to remember what will be going on in the channel at the time. So, yes, there's a chance that the crews survive. But the Royal Navy is going to be very, very, very different. Now... The point you also have to think about in terms of this... And I was sort of talking about the other options and the whole risk fleet strategy. The problem is, who's going to do it? The Russians? Well, they're an, uh, they're a formidable threat, but uh, they're not really going to be able to cave to take on the Royal Navy, even with the Royal Navy having suffered losses. Because remember, what's coming into service at this point after this period, the beginning of line fourteen? Well, that's when the Queen Elizabeths and the Royal Sovereigns, the Isles, start to come into service. Britain has 14 battleships under construction. Or in the process of going through their their testing and, and their testing and uh, their testing and all the other things before commission upon me. So they have 14 ships going through. Yes, they'll lose a lot of ships, but they're not exactly going to have a small fleet after it's over. And the fighting <sighs> Well, the fighting is not going to last long. If you think about this, this whole world war, well, 
It could be over in less than a week under this circumstance. It could. If you have. How do I explain this? If you have 70% of the German army is lost or killed at sea in the channel, combined with 90% of the German fleet, of the high seas fleet, is wiped out. The ships are lost. Most of the crews got either captured or dead. There is no way for the Germans to carry on fighting the war. The British do not need to have a large fleet to storm into the Baltic and take it on. Second, so actually, the ours should really be called the Revenge Class. I think possibly I'm calling them Royal Sovereigns because I've been talking about Sovereign Class battleships. Uh, yeah, but no. Yes, they're also sometimes called the Royal Sovereigns, aren't they? It's a fun thing. It's a fun thing. We'll leave that to one side. Take care, Thomas. And, yeah, the, I don't see the US deciding to declare war on the British for this. Don't know, I wonder if this helps or hinders the cause of women's suffrage. No length of time of women working in men's jobs. I would say... I doubt it hinders it, but it might still take a bit longer. Especially because it's... One of the cases made which give the women the vote when they do get the vote is that they are having to deal with franchise issues caused by the war, i.e. because of the way the franchise was established, people who'd been serving on the Western Front for the previous four years couldn't vote in the elections because of their property status or because they didn't hadn't been in the country for long enough or registered and sent and dressed for long enough. And... Um, the British government wisely realised this was something you had to change. Marcus, well, if... Uh, honestly, there are a few options, but um, it might not be Craddock. You see, you're thinking very simply that it's going to be Craddock who comes home to take charge of fleet, but actually there's another option. And this is an option which is worthwhile considering. In Under this scenario, if Jellicoe and Beatty both die, while Battenberg is still first sea lord, who would you call back to take charge of the combined remaining British naval forces? Not as first sea lord, but as commander of the Grand Fleet. It would probably be Fisher. Who else can you call back to inspire people and to restate the British? You don't want Fisher back as First Sea Lord. No, no, no. You're calling him back as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Navies. At sea. Courageouses are not being developed at this point. They are, remember, the Courageouses are started after Fisher comes back as First Sea Lord. Now, first, would it be possible for the British to ally the Germans against the French if they invade through Belgium as an easy PR win? No. The British don't really get on with the Germans that much.
Vice Admiral Craddock might well come home to take command of the um, battle cruiser force, but that depends again on whether, honestly, Tritt survives. If Tritt survives, he probably gets promoted up dramatically. Sturdy might well get a post, because remember, he's ashore at this current time. Um, so he'd survive. Craddock will probably get called home. There's a few other good officers around. There's the officer, the admiral in charge of the Mediterranean fleet, who's also quite senior. I get hold. I get called home. It's an. You have to think that the immediate consequences are going to be dramatic. Um, I doubt Fisher would sail to London and declare himself Prime Minister. Um, I don't think he would do that. He's not that way inclined. No. If I five two seven five five couldn't do with five, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. They wouldn't do that. Remember this is the cabinet you're dealing with, and whilst they might not want to get involved in what they see as a stupid color, a stupid European dispute that, frankly, is pointless and absurd, they also will do not want to be seen as being dishonourable and stabbing the French actively in the back. There would probably be a bit of a backlash for the Royal British in terms of the numbers of losses, but there again, if they've wiped out the German fleet for it, then the odds are that it's justified. And it's going to sound strange. They've won. They've captured and destroyed all the French. Yes, the Royal Navy has had a tremendously hard battle. Yes. But... You know, things like the Channel Fleet would be considered heroes because they've gone down plucky fighting. Anyway, this now looks about right time to bring to the to start to the discussion point because we have reached the discussion point. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and I'm going to change the timing on the slides. So instead of them giving me roughly eight minutes a slide, they are on 30 seconds a slide, so it's just going to go through behind me while we're having a conversation. And I thought we'd, well, thought we'd at least have about an hour for that. Because I thought this would be a definitely quite a discursive one. Fisher is predicting a battle of Armageddon with Jellicoe fighting the Germans in Channel 1914. Though we already see him as a mad visionary, think of what he think uh, think of what we think of him having won it. Um, well, having been right, but remember he wouldn't have been in charge in the battle. He'd have uh, honestly. There's also the devastation of Jellicoe. I think of Fisher and all his friends are dead. Thinking about Fisher sitting there going, Jellicoe's dead. Honestly, for the Royal Navy, think about it. If you go through it, the list of officers, Cunningham could well be dead. Uh, Somerville, mm, probably alive. 
probably alive at this point. Uh, Henderson dead, most likely. You see, the thing is, the reason I'm saying these people are dead and the crews are going to be dead is because the short range... Uh, yes, the crews can get home from their ships to the Channel Coast very easily, but the devastation of firing these guns at such close range. They're going to wreck superstructures. And that's where most of the officers are. Um, Admiral Cunningham. I thought he was in destroying the Grand Fleet. It might have been not might not have been at this point, but um, no, he was part of the, He was actually he was in the Mediterranean. You're right. He was with the guy. He was shadowing on the Goban and Breslau in the nine in in. Mediterranean, so yes, he probably would be alive. <sighs> King George VI may be dead. Um, let's see. Uh, he was aboard HMS Collingwood. Uh, St. Vincent class dreadnought. So, yes. Um, one of the very early types of 12 inch dreadnoughts. So, um, yeah, he's really not in a good thing. And there's lots of admirals dead. Mark Hunt, Britain's policy is to set up arrangements to contain threats. The last thing you want is other nations wondering if their treaties are worth the cost of the income paper. Yes and no. You have to remember that Britain, the policy hasn't been... The British had only started treaties very recently at this point. Treaties are something Britain now does a lot of, but treaties weren't something Britain did a lot of by that point. at that point. Treaties were wartime issues. And the Entente is an Entente, not an alliance. You... It's very important to emphasize this. The British have been very careful. There is a reason they've been very careful. They didn't want to get suckered into a war with the, alongside the Russians if they didn't want to get involved in it. And that was their main problem. Honestly, if the French hadn't been allied with the Russians, the odds are the British would have had an alliance with the French quite happily. But because of the Franco-Russian alliance, it was an entente. And the entente with the Russians was not going to be renewed. The British had already decided that. In probably 1913, it seems to be. That seems to be a decision which, if you look at some of the British policy, just seem to be coming through. They're not going to renew it with the Russians. And that's going to lead to trouble with the French. John Luke, the USA wouldn't be likely to do anything aggressive, seeing as the RN went all in and crushed the opponent without a massive superiority in USN numbers. They are going to get stonked out of existence. Basically, the Americans are probably think, you know, why do we want to fight the Brits? And the Brits don't want to fight the Americans, especially this thing. I think you would have a few friendly fire incidents. In I noticed it was a factor in the harpoon scenario. It's the point about this battle is there is no good victory for anyone. There is no. Uh, I, I I ran it twenty times trying to figure out for a German victory, and they didn't have one. Because there was even the problem that if the, because the way the Grand Fleet would come in and they'd have had to be at the front. High Sea Fleet would have had to have been at the front to overwhelm the, the Channel Squadron. 
and the Channel Fleet if they're going to fight. So that, that's where they have to be. Which means they're automatically in the worst place for when the battle cruisers come tearing into the liners. So that means that even in the best case, lowest casualty scenarios for the Germans, where they manage to pull out, and they manage to pull out, they lose so many soldiers, such a large chunk of their army, that they can't continue World War I. Uh, the whole scenario smacks of the, smacks of the Second Punic War for some reason. That's what kept going through my head when I was looking at it, and when I was working on it. Bishon, the USA would like to do as they did after World War One: concentrate the battle fleet in the Pacific off of California, using the Uli Open Canal to surge into the Atlantic if necessary. More than likely. How would the RN rebuilding plan, uh, pa building pan out in terms of speed of battleships? Animal designs and concepts like Narod? I'm thinking it's probably, especially after such a close range fight, I think it's Queen Elizabeth's. I think honestly they would be going, well hang on, the battle cruisers turned up first and they were pretty much massacred because they were caught in a close range fight they couldn't get out of. And whilst the British don't like to design for the last war, there's going to be a factor in their thinking. So they're probably going to be pushing for a fast battleship style evolution. So you're probably looking at 28 knot plus battleships, which have armor and gut speed of fire. Whether they go to 15 inch 50 route, whether they end up with 16 inch, uh, 16 and a half inch guns, I'm not sure. But I know they're going to go bigger than 15 inch. They might even go 18 inch because of the J Americans going and the Japanese heading towards 16 inch. The British will not want to have the smallest guns in the thing. Remember, that's that qualitative race. It turns, it le whilst the British will be rebuilding their fleet, they'll still be taking part in a qualitative race with the, Ru with the Americans and the Japanese, and probably the Italians. Because remember, the Italians will be launching the... Um, their really cool answer to Queen Elizabeth. <coughs> Dynamic Hammer, Hammer. What are the chances the high seas fleet sees the ground fleet and just bolts? Well, that is an option, but the trouble is they can't bolt backwards because if the ground fleet's coming down the very point of this day and they're far enough in the channel to land on the French coast, then they're far enough in the channel that the ground fleet can block the channel before they can get out. So they have to go through the ground fleet to get home. This is one of the reasons why the losses are quite so what they are. They have to go through the ground fleet to get home. And the other option, of course, is they bolt out into the North Atlantic and try and, I don't know, traipse around the UK to get home to a Spanish Armada. Still, though, they're going to run into the Grand Fleet before they can get home. So it's, either way, it's, it's not a good scenario for them. So they go to the Atlantic, where are they going to go from there? They run out of fuel and are sitting in the Atlantic. Well, the Royal Navy's not going to worry about them there. I doubt, agreed, I doubt that Washington Naval Treaties would happen. Bishon, what about dreadnought monitors for close events? Shy draft, heavy armor, heavy bulge, maybe 8 times 15 inch guns? That's not really a monitor. Now, what I could see them going, if they start to go for triple turrets, they could end up going for something which has got three turret, uh, three, uh, triple gun turrets. They might choose something which has two turrets and heavily bulged and looks like what they're building for Norway. But... The thing is, for the British to justify that is... It, that, building that, you might as well for the British build a full Dreadnought. British have the infrastructure to build lots of Dreadnoughts at the same time. You might well see the London, uh, the, 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 Thames, uh, the Thames Ironworks re-established to try and keep up with the demand of building battleships. Sigmato type uh, battleship in early 1920s. Um, incomparable is the option which you could be looking at or uh, theoretically I suppose it let's put it this way once you if you consider what's going to have gone down in the channel 
And the other thing with it going down the channel that's going to be really interesting is that the British will be able to recover quite a lot of the ships which are sunk because the channel is not that deep. Okay? So the British will be able to study what's happened to those ships. They will be able to recover them and study them. So with all the information the British will get up, imagine how that's going to affect British design and construction. The sad thing is that in this war is if this one, if this one is, if the battle happens, it's better than World War One as is happening. But if Britain doesn't fight the war of 1920, on a fight, the war of 1920 is nearly at World War Two scale worse. Yep. It's what try imagine it this way. It's World War One style understanding of the world and employment of technology with closer to World War Two technology. Hi, Dan Freeman. There I am. Forgot to consider lack of fuel, but the point about all the massacre of the fleet, running might have saved some ships. Your only option is to try and run through the British Grand Fleet. I think the first generation of ships to be ordered after battle will be an improved line of Queen Elizabeth's. I wouldn't be surprised if the first generation. But the ships that come after that, well, <sighs> if you found, I don't know, 40 or so dreadnoughts on the bottom of the channel and picked them up and have gone over them before scrapping them, imagine how much data and information you're able to cover over what happened to those ships and how they got blown up. Imagine how that's going to affect your ship design. You know, we can't we we can't even imagine the sheer evolution that would cause in the development of the Royal Navy. Qualitatively and quantitatively. But qualitatively will be the massive thing because no one would have access to that level of resource. It's terrible. But think of all those people dead. That's but moving you and you, to an extent, you will have to move on beyond that when you're a nation state and you're thinking about the strategic side. You've now got access to all these ships and how they died, so you can study them and you can study the German ships, the British ships, you can see what worked, what didn't, and you can really develop your fleets in terms of strategic technology. It would have, uh, I the lessons the Royal Navy would have come away with would have been. I don't know if they'd still been obsessed with night fighting as they were in by the time World War Two happened. Possibly, the British do like night fighting; it's a good strategic asset, and it's not something they've been eschewing before World War One. Um, but it's going to be different. John Luke, would the Super Tigers be replaced with Cruisers? <sighs> Who knows what gets built. Honestly, who knows what gets built. The fact is, there would be another battle, or there will be more class of battle cruisers built. Um, well, carrier development depends upon aviation development, and you have to remember, aviation is slowly getting there. So, carrier and aviation development would take place completely outside of wartime. What's interesting is you wouldn't have the technology sharing that goes on historically between the British, the American, and the Japanese at the end of World War One in naval aviation terms, because there wouldn't be the reasons to share. So you might well have a very different scenario. You might have the Americans fighting to develop aviation. The British might well develop aviation as a means of making up for their deficit, their perceived deficit with their losses, and the Japanese may or may not pursue it. Who knows? <sighs> we know Washington Treaty, no tree, 
no Washington Treaty. And also remember, you won't have the Treaty of Versailles put in place as well because you haven't had the horrific World War One you have had. You would probably have the French try and insist on quite a brutal, a brutal treaty, well, as punishing treaty as they could, maybe getting Alsace and Lorraine back off the Germans. But the British won't be in a position, won't be, uh, will be, have done, the, well, be able to claim they've done the bulk of the fighting, their navy's done the bulk of the work, so they will have a whip hand, in to an extent, on the treaty. So the treaty will probably far be accorded with sort of Gladstone ideals, as articulated by Asquith, than the squeezing the German orange till the pip squeaked. I, uh, I would say if the Queen Elizabeth's come, it's six. It's well, as I've said on HMS Argincourt, the Queen Elizabeth class being built. Uh, there's an honest question as to whether or not she ends up uh, with she has triple fifteens or whether she has eighteen inch guns or sixteen and a half inch guns. There's, a, there's an awful lot of stuff up in the air about her. And worthwhile looking into, and something again. I'm going to be this year with, thanks to your support, I'm going to be looking more into, uh, because it is thanks to the support of Patreon. It is thanks to the support of the people who do the super chats, the super thanks, who are subscribers on the channel and who are members of the channel. Those things that I actually have the money to do all this stuff. So, thank you. But they are. But the point is, those ships are going to be built, and then it's going to be next generation are probably going to be improved Queen Elizabeths. And then the generation after that are going to be the ones which are going to reflect any experience of this from the Battle of the Channel. Spey would, Spey would, Spey would alive. And that's another thing. Von Spey would be probably still to survive. Because with the Germans would probably be surrender after this, in which case he'd be allowed to bring his squadron home. The British probably would insist on escorting it home, but he'd be allowed to bring his squadron home. So it might well be that Craddock and Spey meet up at the Falkland Islands, and Craddock escorts Spey home. That's an interesting turn up for the books. With the Irish home rule crisis would also be very differently dealt with because the British the British Expeditionary Force would all be sitting in the UK, but you wouldn't have the massive mobilisation and troops being moved around, so you wouldn't have the pressures of World War One. so Irish home rule might be dealt with differently. I'm not sure, what, not saying what happens, but I, I think it's a different scenario than what you necessarily faced. Also, German and Austro-Hungarian aviation haven't had a hard reset. No, and let's be honest, the Austro-Hungarians probably come out of this with a navy fairly well intact. I doubt the Kaiser would be ordered to... Uh, I doubt there'd be massive changes in force on Germany, because you see, if you're going to enforce these changes, you're going to have to put an army in Germany, and I don't think Britain in 1914, after fighting this, would be wanting to put an army in Germany. So you probably would be dealing with the German government as is. Spey would not. Spey would be coming home because in the nicest way, his ships at that point would represent a massive part a component of the German fleet. If they don't come home, then Germany doesn't have much of a fleet left. I'm not sure if the British would ask for those islands off the coast of Germany. I um, they didn't ask World War One. They uh, did do things to them after. Well, they did do things afterwards in terms of destroying their fortifications. They might do that again. But it's it's a very different scenario because you've had a massive naval battle and the war is over. 
so you've not had a time to build up the level of animosity and upset and hurt and the sheer sheer level of force that you have by the end of World War One. Princess Elizabeth at this point isn't even born. Um, for that, King George V will have actually had to survive. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, she was born in 1926 so that's a long way down the line and as I said uh, if the British don't get involved in a battle in 1914 I think they end up in a war by 1920 and if which might as well get rid of the German royal family and in this scenario I don't see the British marrying the in a nice way the interesting question is whether or not her father meets it lives, meets her mother. Um, there is a definite debate as to whether or not she meets her mother. Elizabeth Bowes Lan will still come into contact with the future George the Sixth. Um, She marries him in 1923, so she still might. She still might. She he proposed to her in 1921, but um, she turned him down. So. There again, Queen Mary did it was it was involved in it, so I, I think they probably still would have met. In which case, the Queen probably does still get born. House of Windsor might not have changed its name. Probably would have done, but might not have. There is a possibility that Wilhelm ends up having to um, abdicate, but. Again, there haven't been the four years of war. This is going to be a plan which has gone completely awry and has been totally destroyed. I can see it being blamed squarely on Tirpitz and von Mocke. They would get the blame completely, not the Kaiser. I'm sorry, Dr. Lott, perhaps the parody was beneath the dignity of the channel. I will save it for lesser chance. No, it's a case of, I can understand why you're going there, but Spey wouldn't think like that because his fleet would basically be the remaining German navy. So there's a thing about, you know, at that point, you need the German... Goban becomes even more important. Goban becomes critical. That's the la probably, possibly, quite possibly the last remaining dreadnought in the German navy. Possibly Bishon, possibly the arts culture gets us other thing, but also there's the fact that the army and navy had the the army hasn't been defeated. It's been a navy that was defeated, and the navy was defeated because the, of the army's plan, which of course the army shouldn't have been involved in because the army didn't understand how to do naval warfare. And so there's enough well, there's enough ways to get around the blame that militarism in Germany probably still survives. I don't know. 
For all we know, George is completely crippled by the shrapnel flying around. The idea of these guns firing at sub mile ranges is just scary. Yeah. That is the quite possibility. We have no idea what happens. Uh, no, he wouldn't be. But there again, it would be a very different war. Think about it. If the war lasts a couple of weeks, then how much does anyone really suffer? Yes, lots of people get killed. Please, do not get me wrong, but the mass mobilizations, the mass destruction of industry, of civilians, of towns, the ripping up of the French countryside, the destruction of Belgium, etc. None of those things would happen. Yes, you'd have a huge loss of life, which will have an impact, but you won't have the four years long war and the destruction that entails and the, and the destruction of the economies that entails it's certainly not going to have the massive debts etc which British, uh, Britain and France etc rack up with America how do you turn down a prince quite easily ask Elizabeth uh, uh, Elizabeth Bow Lyons She even turned out when even when his mother came to say that she was basically she was basically the only woman for him. Um, she still managed to say no. Well, yeah, Edward VIII claimed that the war affected his views on life, politics, and his royal responsibilities. I guess it's possible he may have married much sooner. It may have affected him. He may have changed him. He may have felt. Even more outshadowed by his brother, who a quiet, not really well spoken brother who actually served in action. If the Germans had a secret discipline ship transport fleet to invade France, then that would mean the British wouldn't necessarily feel the need to get involved because there wouldn't be a fleet of air, a fleet for them to get involved with. Well, Andrew, you probably still have horse cavalry for another 50 years, and then there's aviation. Yet there are so many things which we just take for granted as changing due to World War One, which don't change and take time to change. But without assessing the army in Germany, the officer case is, is still intact, which means there's no incentive for them to tolerate a Hitler, let alone to turn upside down the whole country. And Germany also won't stumble into hyperinflation due to accumulated war costs, money printing. The army remains thoroughly conservative as well, so lots of good could come from this. HMS Warspite probably never gets involved in the fight. I think the thing is, there is a good ar an argument to be made for a bloodier war later, but the bloodier war would have to be a long time later. With no high seas fleet left, the British are not going to get involved if there's another ground war. Unless the Germans start trying to rebuild the navy. And the odds are they wouldn't. Under those circumstances. So yeah, if there's a if there's a war in Europe yet later, the British don't get involved. There could still be another Franco-Russian, a Franco-Russian-German war, um, but I doubt Britain and Italy get involved. Honestly, if they can avoid it. I it's a it's a case of this scenario neatly gets rid of the reason Britain would actually even want to be even want to be involved in a war unless the Germans invade Belgium or the French invade Belgium 
And that's the other scenario you have to consider. In a future war, the Germans might not be the mi might not be the major power. They might be the minor power, and the French might be attacking them. In which case, the British might well side with the Germans against the French. I don't think they would have nuclear weapons until. I, I, if you don't have World War One and then World War Two, I don't see you getting nuclear weapons till about the 1960s. Mission: First Cavalry did survive for years. Think of the video of the Chinese army charging their first atomic bomb test. Horses and riders in the gas masks. I think armored cars would appear soon. Armored cars would appear quite soon. I think. Horses, again, they were used in World War II for various operations. Uh, Horse-mounted forces are not necessarily always the most stupid forces, even to current days. Oh, I'm sorry, I know German officer K shouting for revenge. Its navy would have taken this, uh, this burden. And do they have the same political as the army officers do? Since this is still Prussia now? No. And let's be honest, the army consider, the most of the Ger Pr er, German army consider the navy a waste of spending anyway. Do you think Austria-Hungary, John Luke, Austria-Hungary would exit the stage after German defeat and find new friends? Well, the Germans have been propping the Austro-Hungarians up, and remember, the Germans are going to evolve this because of the Austro-Hungarians mobilizing against the Serbians, which has caused the Russians to mobilize. So, there could still be an interesting war going on in Europe. Hello, hello Albert Zaski. Quicker war with no World War I, no no U-boats means the UK retains the world's largest merchant fleet. True, but also think this battle is going to decimate the German merchant fleet. The German merchant fleet gets wiped out in this battle, so the Germans will have to either build a, build a whole new merchant fleet, or they'll have problems, which could give them an advantage again. I still think the tank shows up. There's a lot of convergent evolution towards it, and the ideas are around for years. Just a matter of getting a good enough engine. I think the tank probably shows up in about the 1920s and in 1920s. True, Captain Manager. The R's are built as the R's are built. Uh, don't think that this doesn't change the construction of the R's at all. I would argue probably you get all the queens and all the R's built. So you get six queens, you get H Massage and Core in whatever form she is, and you get all the R's built as battleships. But you would then get another batch of queens probably, and then you get whatever ships come afterwards. Germany has a lot of yards. They can build their own merchant ships. They're quite capable of it. And they probably do so. Because remember, there's not going to be the devastation. No, I did not say how many ounces in a cup. Google is always listening. Google is always listening. I think Austro-Hungary probably find itself breaking up itself into its own interesting civil war. How do you think this would change colonial navies? Now, that is an interesting point. I don't see you having the Washington Treaty System come in place. So the odds are the Australian and the Canadian navies keep expanding as they are, and it's important they do expand for the British. Because after these losses, the British are going to want to rebuild numbers, and they're going to, go to rebuild numbers of ships. But they're also going, and to do that, they're going to need to build up the colonial navies as well as the Royal Navy because the sheer number of people they'll have lost. So I wouldn't be surprised if the colonial navies get built up as well, which could cause issues between the Americans and the British, but it's probably something that can be dealt with.
Answer so, yeah, medical technology development would also be slow. World War One goes artificial limbs and plastic surgery, etc. Hollywood would have a much faster turnover of talent. Um, I think all these things would develop over time anyway. I think the trouble is, as you, it's the pace of development. And the opportunity as well. War tends to allow them um, give people a chance to try things which they wouldn't try normally. Dominion navies, yes, but also I was thinking that the French might also set up a colonial navy in some parts of their part, in some parts of their um, areas. Sorry, just confirming some details for the Australia uh, for Australia planning, which literally flashed off my phone and went, "Ah, oh, I better respond to that now." <laughs> the Anglo-Japanese lines would most uh, would be most definitely continuing the scenario. I think the British and the Japanese would keep on quite happily. It's quite useful for the British, and with no Washington Treaty, and you have to remember the Americans are always one step away from being isolationist. So, the odds of... Stop texting. You were one of the recipients of the text, Dan. So, nicest way. Um, I'm responding to someone who probably isn't watching the live stream. That made, that made my life easier if they were all watching the live stream. Perhaps I should make that as mandatory for the group from now on. We all have to watch each other's live streams. By the way, if you don't know... Um, if you are on Twitch, Garius the Brit, i.e. Gareth, one of our fourth members of um, the Canadian Naval History crew, and one of the people who comes around to us when we for our planned trip to Australia, etc., um, really does some very, very good history stuff when he's talking about uh, when he's doing his gaming, and he's been doing a whole lot of stuff on Crusader Kings Three. And he's a far better player of Crusader Kings 3 than I will ever be. Far better. Some of the stuff he gets up to in it is really quite cool. So if you if you do enjoy the game, please go look him up. And also, please... I think our good friend has been on this channel quite a lot this re recently. And, um, yeah, History Vanguard is on here. And... Uh, da -da -da -da. Let's see, History Vanguard, his details are somewhere in here. He's mentioned his channel strength. Uh, but no, he, he, he deserves more subscribers than he has. Let's go through. I will find it. I will find the notes. Du -du 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 -du. I can't find that section on the chat. Sorry. But it's somewhere in there. And yeah, he deserves more subscribers. He does good uh, good videos. <laughs> Well, the Spanish flu would have stayed in America and wouldn't be as big due to no U.S. Army training camps. The Spanish flu would be... Uh, it could be as big, or it might not be. It could be... It's going to be differently dealt with. Remember, they're also still going to be very crowded cities. Going on, so an actual Indian Navy big yards. Potentially. So the admirals could get... How many admirals as battle cruisers and CVs? Well, okay, Knights of the Coast, everyone. First of all, you have, before you're going to develop aircraft carriers, you have to develop naval aviation and you have to develop aircraft. And that's going to develop at a lot slower space. So I do not see whatever potentially could be the Admiral-class battlecruisers, if they do build Admiral-class battlecruisers, 
but they might well build the Admiral class battleships to come off the Queen Elizabeth's first on this scenario, the new uh, the, a new expanded version of the Queen Elizabeth's after this battle. That that could be, a, you know, I'm not sure what they're going to look like. I think it changes. There is a lot of arguments to go in for what they could be. I don't know what battle crews to follow the second battle of Queen Elizabeth's. It's going to res uh, it's going to depend. Because the second match of Queen Elizabeth is quite easy to see. There's going to be an expanded, improved version of the Queen Elizabeth produced. Because that's your knee-jerk reaction. That's your best available design of battleship. That's your Class A1 battleship design. You're going to just build a build an improved version of that. That's your knee-jerk reaction to make up numbers. But your next builds are going to be based on the information you cover from the vessels you bring up. So you're going to be bringing up vessels from the channel or because of the channel because you can. Let's be honest, the channel is shallow enough, you can bring up those wrecks. And those wrecks you're going to look at, and the ships which are damaged on the shore, you're going to look at, and you're going to study. And that's going to feature in your design. So, I cannot really predict for you what that design would look like, because I cannot predict what lessons they would learn from the destruction of the ships that they find. Independence movements might be delayed. Um, things might be interesting in terms of independence movements. Remember, the British were already heading that way anyway with the Dominion strategy. So there might be actually. Uh, it, it's going to sound strange, but without World War, the devastation of World War One, and that what that does in terms of long term, and well, uh, it might well be the British start down the strategy earlier, which could be better. Okay, because the reason I say it could be better was because. If you don't have the absorption of all the new mandates, etc., to come in after the Treaty of Versailles, etc., because of taking it, dividing up the Ottoman Empire, because of dividing up Germany's empire and all these things, you probably still have some of the German Empire divided up, but, you know. What you probably then have is more a concentration on the existing administration, which might well provide a better system, uh, move certain things along the route the British have decolonization. Or rather, dominionization, where they slowly turn them into self-governing organizations, which hopefully closely align with British interests anyway. That's the British plan. It saves money. We're going uh, Australia. The plan is the plan for this year, but we there we've got to have a timeline, and then we've got to do some fundraising, because as I said last time when I went to Canada, I managed to get a grant, and so that helped me with my costs quite dramatically. And between the grant and honestly all of you, that pretty much paid my costs, which was thankful because I had some unexpected bills to come up, especially in terms of teeth. Um. This year, I haven't qualified for any grant. History Vanguard is the name of the person when they're chatting. I'm not sure. That's not their channel name, I don't think. Uh, did it, did it, did it, did it. Let me check out their channel name. Uh, channels I follow, channel subscriptions. Why am I doing a Christmas song when the Christmas is over? I have no idea. Also, I have a lot of. I've just realized I have a lot of subscriptions to places which are um, to corky video producers and poodle video producers and apparently watches as well. But uh, no, uh, I know they did a video not that long ago. Um, it's called, no, it's not that one, is it? Is it that one? Yeah, Important History, I think. I think that's the one. It's called Important History. I think. 
again, I f probably follow too many naval history channels now because I've got lots of ones which are going around which are very cool naval history channels, but I follow lots of them on Twitter and lots of them on, fa are on YouTube now. Which is my own fault. It makes my life trying to sign us off very difficult. I think I've already covered uh, what that one. Uh, hang on, go back to bomb. I missed that question again. Ah, History Vanguard, yes. Ah, it is History Vanguard. Yeah. It's got 35 subscribers and has done a couple of videos. HMS Tiger was a good one. What happens to the Ottoman Empire? Probably disintegrates at its own pace, merrily. Uh, the rich cuts. The big difference between Germans and Americans building fleets is the Germans are just across the North Sea. Also, it's the numbers, and also, if you look at what the Ger Americans are building, um, it, it basically makes it a qualitative race rather than a quantitative race. The Americans are not building a qu uh, not building a quantitative uh, a quantity fleet. They're building a quality fleet, and that takes makes it a very different um, scenario. Yes, both in important history, which is pretty cool, and. Um, and a few other videos on uh, people are now using my um, book, which I do find cool. Um, also, I'm going to say, oh, Colin. Uh, Colin, uh, you should be receiving a sticker soon, because I've just been sent a note from Patreon saying, saying that there's a sticker on its way to you. So, enjoy. I do love how I have a... I, I, I have for what I call basically the sticker level in my mind in Patreon. And that is the most popular level of Patreon subscribers. The sticker level. Because you get the sticker, I think. Take care, Richard. Mm-hmm. Um, John, Britain is always trying to keep a balance of power in Europe. Yeah, it's a yes means a joke, but to say both joined the and left the EU because of it is sort of true. Yeah. John, Luke, were there any renewed content to war down line? Would Britain follow keeping a power in Europe while pinching eligible colonies from French or Italians? Were they to support Germany? Well, that is one of the points I did, I think I made just a bit earlier. Yes, there is a possibility that if um, Germany becomes the underdog in France and uh, there's a Franco-Russian alliance which becomes the more powerful one, then Britain might well find itself allying with Germany to deal with the Franco-Russians. Because Russia is the big problem for Britain. It's like... It, 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 it's uh, this is going to sound strange. It, it's kind of like Germany and um, Japan and Italy in World War Two. Uh, Japan is the one they've kept pointing uh, that have kept pointing guns at them. Point they've been pointing guns at for the last ooh, decade or so. By the time war actually takes place, but the war starts with Germany and then Italy and then Japan. And actually, the British have been thinking about war with Gertz. Having you think about war scenario of fighting the Japanese, then the Italians, and then the Germans. In that order. And it's kind of like they end up fighting the Germans and the Austrians in World War One, But, um... And they've been actually more likely to engage the Russians. And the whole point about the... This is another reason why it's an entente cordiale, not an alliance. Is because... Whilst they do the entente to try and get out of problems with the French and the, uh, between the uh, between the French and the British to minimise the chance of war, there's the very real possibility in the British mind that they could end up fighting the Russians. The French will come in because of their alliance with, on the side of the Russians, and that means the Japanese then come in alongside the British to help fight the French and the Russians combined. 
And that's the whole reason for the Anglo-Japanese alliance. It's not the Americans, it's not the Germans, it's the French and the Russians. Um, it's an interesting case of what happens. I think the first batch to come after the battle would be, as I said, uh, improved Queen Elizabeth's. Incru improved Argincourt's, really. Because Argincourt is already seems to be an improved Queen Elizabeth. There's a debate as to what exactly her improvements are. And... Well, I would do cartwheels, but there isn't really space in this office. As Dan can testify to, there's not space to do a cartwheel in this office. So I'm, I'm doing the British understated thing instead. Um, the British would have built more battle cruisers, but they would have built them after. So basically, to my mind, the battle cruisers and the would have waited till the next generation built after next the, the first. We've lost ships reaction of building Super Queen Elizabeths or Imperial Queen Elizabeths, which would have probably been based in terms of the study of the ships which have been built or dredged up from the channel. So that's going to have an impact on them. So I can't really predict what they're going to look like or how much changes they do because they're going to be looking at the damage they've survived and what's happened. Uh, yes, Russia was the reason behind the first and second Afghan wars for the UK because they worry about a Russian invasion of India via Afghanistan. There isn't room to swing a cat in there. No, that's why we hug a corgi, not swing one. And we definitely don't try and swing the poodle. It's basically books. Like, the, what people don't realise is that there is a little channel from the door to my desk space. My desk space is like the middle third of the room, i.e. for me to sit in. And not even does it go the full way to my side. It's sort of, there is, a, you, you don't realise that the desk ends, you can't see because my hand's just off screen. But if basically, if you go as far off screen as my hand currently is on screen, that's where the space ends. And there's books here, or rather up to about here, so about to my head height. There's books up on that wall, books down there, and books all around me, and it's supposed to be a railway here with books underneath it, but I won't, the books are on top of it because there's still tools and things in here. The poodle swings you. The, the, the poodle tends to swing at me. He's currently going through a boxing phase, and this is caught, this is caused an issue because my sister went into work and she had a black eye. And people thought it was me, not the dog. And I was sitting there going, A, if I punch my sister that hard, she'd be not, she wouldn't be walking around afterwards. Because I'm quite a big bloke, and in the nicest way. So if I hit her that, that hard, she'd probably have fallen into something and be hospitalised, which sounds really bad now. So loud. But let me explain. I'm a big bloke. My sister is really nice, but she's dyspraxic and really not good at that sort of kind of thing, so if she got hit, she'd fall down. And that's actually what did happen, but she was, the poodle was jumping up to say hello to her because she came in, and he managed to whack her in the eye with his paw. Was that your brother? No, it was the poodle. Things Alex shouldn't say out loud. No, I shouldn't say that out loud. That was, that was actually, but it was just a case of, I was just, I was having this conversation with one of my other work colleagues today. And I'm going, you know, your sister's going like, well, how did she get, did you do it? No, no, that was the poodle. Well, oh, didn't, it's okay. I, 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 I don't hit people. As a rule, if I'm going to hit someone, they would have had to hit me first. And I have, I'm trying to think. I can't say I've never hit a woman because one of my sparring partners in self-defense when I was one for long was actually a girl. So I have actually hit a woman. But we were teenagers at the time and we were in self-defense class. So outside of scenarios where it was training, I haven't ever. And I wouldn't because my mom would kill me. I wouldn't want to do it anyway, but my mom would kill me. Um, but, you know, it was the poodle. <laughs> it 
Do not brag. You couldn't protect the Brawlings. No, I cannot protect the Brawlings. This is how... This is the nicest way. I am the only boy in numerous cousins, as I've said before. I am not pen-pecked. I am outvoted. Never hit a woman. And please note, the sparring partner, she was good. And the reason she was fighting blokes was because none of the girls wanted to fight her anymore because she was apparently too violent for them. I found a good training. She was fast. <laughs> Brooks also mean insulation. Yes. No, Mark, I don't think it was much. <laughs> Domestic abuse, brutal pigeon. <laughs> well, to be fair, we went for a, a walk in the dogs before the live this evening, and I think it was Domestic Abuse Corgi Edition, because I'm walking the poodle, and my sister was walking the corgi. And I kept hearing his voice going, No! Don't do that! Don't do that! And the corgi decided he wanted to be carried. And so how he was making his way was trying to climb up my sister. And he was pulling down her trousers. So, <laughs> in, this is in a public street, and my sister is trying to hold the dog, trying to hold him away with the, the lead, while also trying to pull up her trousers, because he's... I'm just in there going, uh, I just look at the poodle and go, we're walking away from this, aren't we? And the poodle just goes, woof. Okay. <laughs> Off topic, I know, I do apologise. Uh, this just keeps getting more on. Yeah, I know. I, I I suppose I'm sort of trying to lighten up because see, uh, the and I had this conversation with Glenn Stewart when I was doing this. The people who kill off millions of people in an afternoon, historians looking at what ifs and science fiction writers. Well, the corgi was trying to climb up. It thought it was climbing up. And unfortunately, it wasn't climbing up. It was pulling stuff down. <laughs> mm. I, know how, uh, Rose, I know how big the fluffy researcher system is. And I have uh, had a husky and now a Bernese shepherd dog. When they step on your foot, it really hurts. When they jump at you, that is a lot of force. Yes. And they are... When he's on his hind legs, he's big. He is big. Your name was not taken in vain. I was explaining how you and I were discussing this the other day. That should do. Doctor has dug a hole so deep that we can have trench wars for a long this point. I don't think I have. I have probably explained a bit too much and a bit overshared, but I'll leave it up to one side. But it was just. It just, I don't, I don't know how we ended up on it, but we did. I think we were talking about black eyes, and that just sprigged it out of my mind. Sigma Richards, what's the first 15 inch battlecruiser if Britain doesn't go to war? The generation after, if Britain doesn't go after, it goes to war, then there's a battlecruiser which is be built after Queen Elizabeth class. Uh, have a sudden end service, and that'll be where it is. How do I think you can improve your videos, Sister Vanguard? Just keep doing them. That's what we all do. Keep doing them. My first video videos were terrible. 
I know I still have some of the bad habits, but I, I, I try and correct them. Uh, let me screw it. Artillery, napalm, and grape shot are, are in the current book I'm trying to finish. A few savages, though. Yeah, trying to uh, trying to justify using artillery to blast savages back to the Stone Age seems a bit excessive because, to be honest, savages probably aren't far removed from the Stone Age if they're truly savages. <laughs> if they're just lesser developed nations, and that's um, something different. That squad. Uh, oh, Dan Freeman. With 80% of the German army wiped out to sea, how quickly do the Russians or Austro Hungarians beat each other to bloody and horrific stalemate? If the Germans are forced to concede and surrender or knocked out of the war, then the odds are the Austro Hungarians are brought to the table as well, and they get a nice negotiation, and possibly the Russians get expansion at the expense of the Austro Hungarians without actually having to fight it for it. <laughs> This was Swiss, uh, Swiss ambassador when asked by a German diplomat what their 250,000 man militia would do if the German army German invaded with a 500,000 man army. Shoot twice and go home. I'd say shoot three times. And go home would probably be more accurate, but you know, you have to count for some misses. It's TMI with Dr. Clark. Sorry. The, 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 the funny things you sort of go, what the frick? So now we're after the revolution pastry. It's. Well. The Russian Revolution. There still could be a revolution in Russia. Whether or not there would be the full communist revolution is a different matter. There might well have been a Menshevik revolution still. There might well have been that, but when it would have happened is a different matter. I'm going to show it four times. You're supposed to double tap, aren't you? Eh. Well, you have to have some of them alive to take the bodies back with them, otherwise you've got to deal with the smell yourself and you can't go straight home. That sounds very callous to say, but it is true under that scenario. I think you'd be dealing with a Menshevik revolution probably 1919, maybe? I haven't seen a new Avatar. To be honest, I've, I have barely watched the first Avatar. Um, it was quite interesting for a bit. I was quite impressed by the, by the cinematography and the graphics. And then... Um, well, to be honest, my preferred ones were um, How to Train Your Dragon and Zootropolis. Sorry, I like a comedy. Kerensky won't fall if the war's over. But also, Kerensky might come to power. There's also going to be a scenario that the Tsar is going to have a victory. Okay, the Tsar and the Russian army are going to have a victory. That can buy you time. Do Glorious and a sister get built? Well, probably not, because why is why would you build ships which are for a Baltic plan when you don't have to go and invade the Baltic? You'd be building your ships for another plan. You wouldn't be building to go and invade the Baltic. It looks back at the long patrols from then. Wow, some of them are really multi-part long. 
I think I may have brain bleached them <laughs> because of lockdown uh, psychosis, I'm afraid. It probably is sensible. Now for 52755, uh, Quintuple 5, would it be possible for France to have struck before Germany would attack? Allah Bismarck. Um. The trouble is, the French are going to run into the same problem as the Germans if they invade them. They either go through Belgium, Switzerland, or they go straight into their fortifications. The French are planning to go straight into the German fortifications. I haven't seen the new Renfield trailer. But there again, and I will point this out to people, I, at the moment, am writing, prepping, all sorts of things, and teaching from home, which means I spend, on average... 12 hours a day in this office and I don't tend to watch much television and when I do it tends to be Netflix or Amazon Prime and that tends to be on that screen while I'm writing on this one. Then it. Well, time for me to return to the consequences of artillery versus magic at Allosaurus. Good night all. That... Uh, that just sounds worrying. Honestly, I would say an invasion of Switzerland with its narrow passes, landmines, artificial avalanches, mountains, and general things. You do you not need a. It's not a. It's not a two to one strategy. You need at least a seven to one, and that's always what we know for force overmatch. You need a seven to one in your area of attack, and you probably are looking at needing at needing more likely if they have a two hundred fifty thousand man army in militia armed there. Uh, you probably need somewhere in the region of two and a half million. Nice, Aaron. You're asking me about a book which is £26. Please do not bring that up as expensive. Um, let's see. In my Amazon thing alone, and this is going to sound like humble bragging, but it's not. It's just the reality of what you get to in terms of history at certain points. Uh, the cheapest book I have is £40. There is a book I have in there which is 75 87 uh, there is a book in here for 113. There is a book in here for 440 some 42, I think. Yeah, basically 442 pounds. It's 441 pounds 97. But let's be honest, that's 442 pounds. And that's in my Amazon folder. In my Amazon thing. Basically, I have. I have 10 items in my Amazon basket and they come to a total of £1,500 and they're all books. So yeah. Welcome to doing history. <laughs> Admittedly that last really expensive one is one of my uh, one of those maritime law textbooks. Which I was discussing the other day about. That's the reason I was discussing about how expensive they are, is because that's literally I've worked out which one I'm buying this year. Um, if the British didn't go to war, do you think the government go? over the top on building bigger and better battleships. Yes. That's why I said H missing comparable. There.
That's fine. I listen to, uh, to music and I white noise. I have to watch anything I get distracted. I'm very selective over the programs I tend to watch as what well, uh, have on the background. Um, Grand Tour slash Top Gear are good ones for me to have on the background. Basically programs that you can just meant to almost enjoy on one level without actually having to pay too much attention to. Uh, white Collar I used to find good for that scenario. 442. Uh, no, that's... Um, that is a book on the... Uh, yeah. That is one of the translations of um, my favourite Dutch philosopher on, on maritime law. Which, of course, is... Let's make sure I'm pronouncing his actual name correctly, because if I get it wrong, it's going to be terrible, and people are going to be annoyed at me. Just going to be easier to just. Ah, oh, there it is. So, uh, it's Hugo the Groot. I keep wanting to say Grotius. Yes, it is. I am the Groot. And it's one of his books. He has about three or four treaties. And this is one of them I have. Uh, one of the ones I haven't got. And getting them translated, getting the versions, uh, let's put it this way there were not many printed. Of the translations to English, and there is different. There are differences between the translations of the recent ones and the older ones. Take care, Bishop. The Russians could push for a hard peace for all they wanted, but if the Royal Navy is the, has won the has won the war at the loss of a lot of ships and treasure, then the uh, ships and a lot of people, then the um, Brit then the British will get to do the whip hand. It's a very simple thing. The others can talk a big game, but the British will go. You do it our way, or we're just not. Go we're just going to agree a separate peace and let them carry on fighting. Or worse, ally with them, and hmm. the knight and the blast furnace is now two hundred eighty-four pounds. Come, Cameron. In a no-war scenario, we see Germany invasion of France. Could we see the British Royal Navy retaining, building large numbers of motor torpedo boats as a recruit from strike force and channels while the building destroys? Um, there's possibility of that. Honestly, there is a possibility of motor torpedo boats appearing, but it's one of those things of they do them, but they'd also you'd have the legacy of the motor torpedo boats. It depends on how the motor torpedo boats or the French did against the German invaders. If they manage to score some good hits, yes. If not, then they'll be worried about it. The Groot sounds like a boat. Oh, he's not even the most expensive. Honestly, the books written by uh, William Scott, no, not William Scott, William Murray, and two Willi and the two Williams I get confused, are probably the most expensive of those three. And I put up William Murray, William Scott, and Hugo de Groot to give you an example of the expenses of looking at the prize law and maritime law. If no war, the British submarine arm probably expand is probably expanded as well. 
probably expanded. Right, um, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. I have. It's now 10 o'clock. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. The Long Patrol recorded video comes out on Saturday. There will be the first of a whole feast of comment response videos coming out tomorrow. And when I say feast of comment response videos, basically they're going to be tomorrow, Monday, and Wednesday to get for, to do them for the Carol the Christmas season. So I hope you're going to enjoy them all. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for your kindness. Thank you, Inns Morris and Jack Ray and Steve Richards, Gogo Lander, Dope Squad, Just Funk, History Vanguard, Carl McGasberg, Colin Cameron, uh, Don Rick Iron Hammer, Bijon, Dan Freeman, of course, and Dan and Jack and Glyn, thank you for adminning. Colin, um, HMS for Dunn, thank you. John Shea, thank you. Amelia Burrow, thank you. Jess P, thank you. Uh, Scott, I think I've said thank you, but if I haven't, I will, though. And History Vanguard, of course, thank you. Stephen Richards, thank you. John Young UK, uh, John Young, uh, thank you. And um, Thor Vanderbilt, thank you. Costa Rousinus, Carl Vergasberg, thank you. Paul Amos, thank you. Captain Banjo, thank you. And let's go for a see if I've spotted anyone else. Once he's up, thank you. Tanifelka, thank you. And Serban Kratu, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Sorry about the over sharing, but it was a kind of interesting point of my day and a kind of weird point of my day, and it ended up coming out. <sighs> thank you, Byron Newman. Thank you. Ooh. DGB40, thank you. And everyone, thank you. Thank you, Colin Cameron. That's very kind of you. I hope you enjoyed it. And as I said, the recorded video comes out on Saturday. So I hope you look forward to that as well. And what have we got coming up? Well, that's worth while we talking about as we're at the end. Normally I do have a question at the end of videos, I know, but I'm not doing a question at the end of the live because there is still very much from last... I think last Tuesday... Not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday before that, the first Tuesday of the year, uh, which is the um, did it, did it. the third. I think it came out on the third. There is the uh, the year of the cruisers end of year um, video, which looked at all the cruiser technologies and stuff like that, and that was full of questions and actually isn't the sort of an exam paper with a channel in Discord for it, and I. Well, if you want to go, if you want to look at questions, please go to look at that video, and I hope you enjoy the questions and find them interesting. All right. Thank you very much, Sharon. Take care, and have a nice evening. Thank you for watching. And what we've got coming up. Next week, we have Bijeron's French Interwar Carrier Aviation. Then we have the story of the First Fleet founding of Australia. I'm sure the live has been actually set up properly. Uh, we have Dragonfire class and other gunboats service in World War II on the 2nd of February. And next week we have steam engines. Just thought I'd do, I'd do a look at steam engines and look at their properties and their development. I thought you'd find it interesting. Take care, Aaron. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Ruhon. Bye.